due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12 pursuant to executive order 2020-04. This public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing on all bills referred to the committee and scheduled in the House calendar for today. An executive session may be held on any bill referred to the committee. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporarily to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to contemporarily listly, listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the General Court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House rules in RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at ledge.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance with each member states their presence. Please let also state whether there's anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Okay, Keith, are you there? I'm here. All right, you're on. All right, Representative Hunt. I am here and I am alone. Representative Patusek. I am here, I am upstairs in my room and my wife is downstairs. Representative Osborne. Representative Ammon, I'm here and I'm alone. Representative Abramson. 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 Representative Bonnyham. Here. Representative Palma. Palma. Here and alone. What do we have in the next? Representative Reason. Present and alone. Representative Johnson. Here in the LLB, alone. Representative Terry. Present and alone in the room. Representative Bartlett. Here alone in my room. Representative Abel. Uh, present and uh, my wife is here for the next about five minutes and then leaving. Representative Herbert. No. Representative Van Houten. I'm here and I'm alone. Representative Fargo. I'm here and I'm alone. Representative Weston. Here and alone. Representative Bellew. Here, home alone. Representative Burroughs. I'm here, I'm alone in this office. Representative McAleer. Representative McAleer. Okay, that's the role, Mr. Chair. We have, looks like 15 present. We'll open up the public hearing on uh, Senate Bill 18. And is uh, Senator Birdsell, is she there? I am here. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're already on. How, how did you do that? That's a... Somebody promoted me. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. <laughs> OK. Uh, so good morning and welcome to the House Commerce Committee. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Regina Birdsell. I'm the state senator for District 19, which encompasses the town of Derry, Hampstead, and Windham. And I am the prime sponsor of Senate Bill 18. And Senate, Senate Bill 18 um, allows the tasting of um, distilleries to come to farmers markets and they limit the amount to half an ounce per label per person. Um, it just adds to the RSA what uh, the breweries and the wineries um, are able to do. And it's pretty much targeted for only 
uh, incubator distilleries in, in um, the state. And I think you'll hear from a number of the distilleries, hopefully, um, I know the one from Derry, I, I believe he should be on the line, Andy Day. Um, and it limits the um, distilleries to only, I think, um, distilleries that have that um, have 10,000 um, bottles so that they per year so that they can um, keep it an incubator process. And in the Senate uh, Senate hearing, uh, the the uh, Liquor Commission was in full support of the legislation. And I don't know if, um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take any. Okay, do we have questions from the committee? We are somewhat familiar with this issue since <laughs> music has a similar bill. So, <laughs> so we might not be too much uh, uh, questions on this issue. And let's see, Representative McClear. Uh, oh, you're, he's in the wrong place. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move promote the panelists. Okay, so you, do you have a question, or you just have your hand up for me to promote you, Chris? Uh, okay, now I have another. So no no questions. Okay, now I have another question from. Julie H. I'm not sure who Julie H. is. And I think that's Representative Herbert. Oh. And so we need to, um, yeah, apparently there must have been a problem getting people signed in and we should be sure that they are included in the roll um, count call. Right. right. So Keith, make no- I'm adding them now. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So is that you, Chris? Are you, is that your wife's name, Julie? Because I don't see you. But. He's he's muted. Oh, there, he there he's unmuted. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm. Um, I didn't show up when I first came in, so I'm trying to get squared away here. Okay, no problem. You're all. Uh, you're, you're in. Same, that. same thing yeah. happened to me. I, yes. I was, I was on, but you couldn't see me. <laughs> right. Well, I I um because you came in, you, whatever you logged in at, you didn't log in on the thing that they sent you like an hour ago or sent you before. If you if you came in a different way, like say from the calendar, then you're coming in as an attendee rather than as a panelist. So, so then I just have to promote you. So, okay, see no questions for the Senator. Uh, I guess we're all set, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, now does anybody else wanna? Speak on this issue. It's, um, let me pull my sheets up here. Sorry. Um, and Aiden Moore had had registered. Okay. All right. So I will. I and he's will. he's already in the panel. He's already up. <laughs> really, you're way ahead of me today, Pam. Well, <laughs> I was. I was just trying to help. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nothing okay. new there, um, Mr. Chair. <laughs> right. Okay, Attorney Moore um, uh, from the Liquor Commission. You want to speak to this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, good morning, committee members. Uh, you've heard from Senator Birdsell. I really am here to see if there are any technical questions you might have um, on this bill. And if not, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, at any point in time during the day. Okay. So uh, I guess just to make sure, so this is the one that you guys amended in the Senate and everything in this bill is now the way you think it's uh, appropriate. Uh, yes, we, we worked with uh, Senator Birdsell to uh, craft some of the amended language uh, or the, some of the language that you see to uh, limit it to small businesses that are operating solely within the state and uh, in an attempt to make sure that this is uh, an effort to promote New Hampshire businesses and really not become a platform for larger uh, distilleries from out of state to come in to participate. Okay, great. Uh, Re Representative Abel has a question for you. Yes, thank you. Um, could you just quickly review for us um, 
how issues like checking uh, identification to make sure someone is uh, of legal age and so forth, how, how that would be is covered in the bill. Excuse me, thank you, Representative Ray, for your question. Um, you can see in the language that you have above, uh, excuse me, lines, I believe two through 10, describe the, the process and limitations. Farmers markets are a uh, process that is controlled locally. So when a distiller is going to participate, uh, whether it's a distillery or a winery or a beverage manufacturer, uh, they need to register and pay whatever fees are gonna be necessary at the local level follow whatever rules that exist at the local level for placement, et cetera, hours of uh, operation. And then it will be incumbent upon any of the licensees who are participating. Uh, the umbrella that exists over this entire process is RSA 1795, which is a statute that uh, prohibits alcohol from being provided or sold to an intoxicated person or to a person under 21. So any of the businesses that are licensed by the commission uh, would need to adhere to that um, statutory guideline at all times of their operation. So uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, sir. Okay, Representative Bartlett. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for coming to see us, um, Mr. Moore. Um, Mine is a similar question to uh, Representative Abel's. I mean, it was kind of in light of the hearing that we had yesterday and kind of going over enforcement issues. So that kind of um, um, made me a little bit more informed, although small, small amount. Um, I, again, if we're going back to, this is a change from beer and wine to hard liquor. Um, and I, I see that that it's a smaller amount that the distillers would be able to um, offer. A half an ounce per label. Are you aware of any of these small distilleries that have more than one label? Uh, thank you for your question, Representative. Uh, I can't tell you for certain exactly uh, how many distilleries have more than one label. Um, and I would suggest that Probably if a distiller were going to participate, they'd probably want to bring their entire line of products. Uh, so if they were to produce a whiskey or a rum or a vodka or a gin, uh, most likely they would want to be bringing those products uh, along. That, uh, that being said, I think there's uh, certainly a, a concern that uh, farmers markets don't in, turn into a happy hour where you get to uh, just kind of work your way down the line and drink and drink and drink. Uh, the half ounce, again, we're, we look at some of the sizes based upon the alcohol content uh, of the products. So a half ounce uh, spirits rather, if 80 proof are made up of 40% alcohol by volume. And uh, so therefore the decision to confine it to a smaller amount is, is really to uh, try to provide the consumer with an opportunity to taste, but yet not such a quantity that um, it would be something that they could become intoxicated on solely. Now, if, if a business that's at a farmer's market has multiple labels and just wants to start serving them, uh, most likely they're gonna charge for them to sample it. And uh, hopefully the uh, pricing of it would be such that it wouldn't be uh, an encouragement for the, for the person to over consume. And as I mentioned to Representative Abel, governing and overseeing this entire process would be RSA 1795, which would uh, make it unlawful for the licensee to serve a person to the point of intoxication. Can I ask another question? For the question, may inquire. Thanks very much. Um, so I've been to the Maiden New Hampshire Expo and is, more, is, is a mead considered a distilled product? Uh, no, no. meads are kind of in a world of their own. Um, they're, uh, the, the, your committee has over the years uh, taken up many definitional changes and percentages of alcohol by volume. Uh, so within the definition of a beverage, mead is kind of defined. So it's, it's, uh, um, it certainly is an alcoholic beverage and 
based upon its classification, um, would be eligible to be brought to a farmer's market for tasting. Right, and the answer would be it's be a wine pour. Okay, so that's a wine. That's a wine. And we pour. know that Moonlight Meadery, which I happen to like very much, um, has a lot of meats. So they can have all those different, they already can have all the different tasting of all the different meads. Yes, ma'am. Subject to whatever the, the limit on uh, wine is. And then if Tamworth Distillery comes down, of course, I don't know how many bottles they do per year. Is that considered an incubator distillery? Well, we would, we would use that. Um, I can't tell you for exact, exactly what their production is annually. Um, and I think what we'll probably do if this were to become law is uh, when a uh, business is, uh, we would notify these distilleries uh, based upon what production levels they have reported, uh, if they're eligible to participate in the farmer's markets or not. Okay, so that would be up to the Liquor Commission to notify the distilleries. Well, we, we would obviously look at their figures. They're the ones who report to us their production. Okay. So we, we would make sure that they knew of the law change. Okay. Uh, probably the association is going to inform the members of any law change anyway. But we would certainly work with that industry to make sure that they understand what the limitations are uh, on this. Uh, it should it become law. Thank you very much. You and, and just so uh, everybody knows, so a half an ounce is actually a third of a shot. The shot is actually an ounce and a half. So it would be, you would have to take three samples before you had a shot of powered alcohol. That would do it for me, but. <laughs> but, <you can. laughs> but you know, a martini has like three in it. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't make that taste good enough for me. <laughs> okay, any other questions for uh, Attorney Moore? Seeing none, we thank you very much. Uh, all right, I have nobody else signed up. So I, oh, I do see a hand raised uh, and it's Andy Day from Dory Distilling. Good morning, Andy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Committee, for being here. My name is Andy Day. Uh, I own Duare Distilling uh, in downtown Derry. Um, I appreciate you guys being here today uh, and hearing this. Um, Senator Bridzel uh, has worked with us in the past and, and really done a lot of good things. And I, I feel like this is uh, the next step in um, helping small business. Uh, we would be one of these uh, incubator distilleries, uh, small production, and just trying to get our name out there. Um, some of these questions actually came up uh, in the Senate hearing. Uh, and I wanted to address that um, we are a business and uh, we take uh, alcohol very seriously uh, and want people to have a safe experience with it. Um, we also don't want to give away everything. <laughs> so I do have probably 20 different products. Um, I would probably select uh, a handful of those that I would want to display at the farmer's market. And then very much like I do in my tasting room, when someone comes in and says, oh, well, what do you have? Um, my question to them is, well, what do you like? Um, because I don't want to taste somebody through everything that I have. I would rather narrow down their choices and give them a couple of samples and see what they like, because at the end of the day, um, I want to make that sale. Um, so I will also say that distilleries, wineries, uh, and breweries um, tend to work together collectively to make sure that everyone has a safe experience. Uh, so when it comes to things like IDing, um, over serving, uh, just monitoring people's alcohol intake, um, we'll kind of signal to each other and communicate, uh, you know, this, this person probably doesn't need anything else uh, and just kind of work as a team. Uh, so we're, we're very excited about this. I um, would very much like to see this bill pass. It would be uh, extremely helpful for us. I appreciate your time. Okay, uh, Representative Petrusik has a question if you're willing to entertain one. Uh, yes. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you believe that as a board of directors member of the dairy farmers market, uh, I've worked with uh, Andy Day on other bills and uh, we're very strict and stringent on who gets to taste, where they get to taste. We have uh, areas marked out according to the uh, state statutes. And uh, I'm looking forward to working 
with him on this bill also, would you believe? Yeah, that means you can't, you don't have to answer the question, Andy, but <laughs> I pre if you want to say something it. nice about the dairy <laughs> farmer's market, you can do that. Okay. Uh, oh, I do have another hand up. Uh, Christopher Burke. We'll promote him up. Thank you very much, Andy. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Hi, a uh, quick introduction. I'm Christopher Burke. My wife and I own Cathedral Edge Distillery in North Conway, New Hampshire. We are, I believe, the newest distillery in New Hampshire. We opened in December, so we are certainly in that incubator phase. Uh, we also have the distinction of being New Hampshire's first certified organic distillery. Worked very closely with the, uh, the Ag Department to get that certification and certainly would welcome an opportunity to meet people at farmers markets who value uh, or prioritize fresh and organic ingredients in their products. So we certainly encourage support of this bill. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, you know, questions. Uh, all right. Is uh, I have no more hands up. So I guess we're going to ready to close this hearing unless somebody else has something else they want to add. Uh, seeing none, um, we had uh, 10 supporters and one person was opposed. Not uh, sure who that was. Oh, it was uh, oh, Kay Fry, yeah, of course, from uh, New Futures. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, so being that, uh, we will close the public hearing on Senate Bill 18. And uh, next is... So we're, where are we scheduled? So we're right, I did type this one tight, right? Didn't I? Yeah. So we're we're on time, we're-, we're Seven know. Bill 14, yeah. Seven okay. Bill 14. Okay, so we'll open up the public hearing on Senate Bill 14. And um, I believe Lou told me he wasn't, was this the one that Lou wasn't gonna be able to attend? Well, he's in the attendee. There he is. Okay. So that was a different bill. Yeah, that's right. That was the trust bill. Okay. So, uh, Senator D'Alessandro, I'm promoting you up to a panelist and you can introduce the bill. Okay. You're on, Lou. You have to just uh, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, for the record, I'm Senator Lou D'Alessandro. I represent District 20, Manchester Wards 3, 4, 10, 11 of the town of Goffstown. Come before you as the prime sponsor of, of Senate Bill 14. Uh, last session, this bill this bill passed the Senate. However, it, was, uh, it wasn't included in an, om an omnibus bill when it went across. This bill was refiled at the request of the New Hampshire Liquor Commission. A key component of state revenues is the profits produced by the sale of, of, of liquor. This bill will give the commission the ability to directly ship liquor. In turn, this would allow the commission to add another arrow uh, in, their, in their quiver to promote the sale of spirits and wines throughout the state and, and nationally. Uh, under Chairman Mollica's leadership, the commission has, has built many new physical locations and, and created an online presence. This, this allows this allows them to to expand those these opportunities. Uh, every time we put a budget together, we depend upon the revenues from the liquor commission uh, to put uh, our budget in a positive in a positive mode. And this gives the commission another opportunity uh, in, in its its toolkit uh, to promote itself and, and to. Uh, uh, add additional revenues to the state of New Hampshire. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you. Uh, I'm sure people are here from the commission who can give you uh, a much more extended presentation, but it's always an honor to appear before this committee, uh, Representative Hunt and uh, distinguished members of the committee. Great to see you early in, in the morning. Everyone looks bright and cheerful and uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, it's a great American day. Representative Hunt, and uh, with that, I hope that you'll pass this on and we'll do great things. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Senator D'Alessandro. It's always a pleasure to have you in front of Commerce. Uh, so do anybody have any particular questions? So uh, I guess just to reaffirm, this language is exactly the same language yes. we passed. Yes, yes. Uh, we do have a question. Representative Weston has a question. Uh, thank you for taking my question. And thank you, Senator D'Alessandro, for coming to testify for us. I Pleasure. have a question on the amendment. Uh, is that something that you could address? Uh, I haven't. I haven't. I don't have the amendment be, before me. So, could I could I ask the question? Sure. And and it looks as though maybe uh, Representative Patuchik might be able to answer it. Um, um, my question yeah. on the amendment is that um, we have that that pesky word shell in there. And I know that there are some small retailers that might be interested in, in um, selling these products, but are, would a small shop uh, be required to um, apply for a direct shipper permit? They may have no interest in shipping their product. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Representative, for the, for the, for the query. Um, I don't have the amendment in my original bill. It, it said may register, so I, I haven't seen. I haven't seen the. I have I don't have the amendment before me. I apologize for that. I think someone from the commission might be able to address that question right. succinctly. And so they're they're there. I, I think I think they're in the queue. I think Representative Hunt. Yes, uh, uh, Attorney Morris available. So, uh, uh, Representative Weston, are you uh, are you referring to Representative Lang's amendment that we got was floated around? Yes, I am. And maybe I was premature in asking the question. So the senator might be totally unaware that 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 amendment is floating around. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Oh, so, but um, just so you know, uh, Attorney uh, 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 Senator, um, what the what it is is a reference to um, that allowing in-state beverage manufacturers uh, or wineries or and distillers to be able to uh, direct ship. Um, currently, uh, the only people who can direct ship uh, into New Hampshire is from out of state, and that is what the uh, the amendment is about. So it's. It is a, a definitely a totally different issue. Is that what you wanted to talk about, Patusa, uh, John? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Representative Lang asked me to introduce the uh, the amendment, uh, and okay. Well, <laughs> okay. So did, did, he go right to, did he go to legislative services and actually have an amendment drawn up? Uh, yes, it, it was distributed. Uh, okay. Because I, I saw the language, I saw the emails about it, but I didn't know that it was an actual. Right. Uh, okay. I don't know if Miss Smarling distributed it to the uh, committee, but I, I, I was, I was sent on, a, you know, the, the ver Yeah, I was sent the copy with the unapproved on it, so I. Yes, we received it. it. Yeah. It's okay. Real. Okay. I, okay. I, I have been out of the loop this, uh, this week, and and. Uh, and I, I think we should copy the senator on this too. <laughs> so we will certainly, uh, Senator, <laughs> we'll let you. We'll send you a copy of the amendment. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So we have any other uh, questions for Senator D'Alessandro? Seeing none, or I assume that hand. Okay. Seeing none. Uh, thank you very much, Senator. Thank and, you, uh, uh, Aiden. You're you're still up. So now, uh, Attorney Moore from the Liquor Commission can uh, respond to the underlying bill, and I guess uh, you should respond to the amendment also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator D'Alessandro. Um, representatives, the Senate Bill 14 gives the commission the authority to register trade names with the Secretary of State and to operate as a direct shipper of liquor and wines in this and other jurisdictions. And as the uh, Senator mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, this, uh, this bill is very important to the commission as uh, we try to maintain our competitiveness um, with other states to give us the opportunity um, as the markets open across the country to register as a, a direct shipper um, in other states and to pursue the opportunity to uh, ship into those states from New Hampshire as well as the ability uh, to work within the state of New Hampshire and serve customer needs for the purposes of uh, products that the commission sells 
and to possibly ship those uh, working with the New Hampshire manufacturers to develop a strategy that would uh, make um, delivery an important part of what the commission does in the way of producing revenue for the general fund. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions on the underlying bill, Representative, if you, if there are any. Okay, um, I do not, is there any questions on the underlying bill? Um, and I, I, I'm not sure that you have seen this amendment then, I assume? Uh, I, I have seen a draft of something floating around. Uh, okay. If that is in fact what the amendment is, I can probably give yeah. you some information on it if you'd like. Yeah, so uh, the language of, yeah, just adding, including in the state of New Hampshire, uh, so who is eligible to take advantage of the direct shipping license. Um, procedurally, sir, does that need to be, is it, has it been officially introduced yet? Or? Evidently it just did. <laughs> now, now, I would say that uh, um, normally if something like this, you know, I, I, the chair would have to rule on germaneness. <laughs> and, uh, and then decide whether that uh, it, we would need to hold a separate hearing on germaneness or not. At this moment, I'm, I'm going to hold off on making that decision. Uh, so because I just need to uh, know, uh, understand the consequences of adding this, this in because it is direct shipping. So it is the direct shipping statute. So it's certainly germane enough in terms of the actual RSA. Uh, but in terms of the, uh, the intent, um, the difference between, between a licensee and that the, this uh, underlying bill is just the commission. But so I guess, uh, how, do you, how do you feel about uh, in-state uh, uh, producers being able to direct ship to people in New Hampshire? Thank you, sir, for your question. Um, the, the, if, if I understand the amendment, which would uh, amend RSA 178 colon 27, adding in the phrase, including the state of New Hampshire. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, and for the member benefit of the committee members who were not around at that time, uh, direct shipping was created with largely with the uh, uh, legislation introduced by Representative Hunt uh, to uh, allow businesses located outside of the state of New Hampshire to register with the state of New Hampshire um, and to ship their products into the state to consumers uh, who wish to purchase products that might not be available within the state. Uh, that has been uh, in place for some time. And um, the change that is, that is being proposed would now appear to extend the direct shipper uh, permit process to every licensee who is licensed within the state of New Hampshire. Uh, it speaks to um, including the state of, excuse uh, let me, if I could just uh, step back for just a moment. And I'd like to kind of parse through the words here with you a bit. Notwithstanding any other provision of law to the contrary, any person currently licensed in its state of domicile, including the state of New Hampshire, as a wine manufacturer, beverage manufacturer, importer, wholesaler, or retailer may apply for a direct shipper permit from the commission. Uh, that's pretty broad. And it looks like everybody except a rectifier to me. Well, it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have, rec, it doesn't have rectifiers. Right. It, it doesn't have nano brewers. Um, it speaks to terms such as the use of the word importer. The word importer does not appear in Title 13. Um, it presents a challenge to us, if this were to pass as written, to determine an importer is someone who is licensed maybe in an out-of-state uh, facility, or out-of-state to business rather. Uh, wholesalers, are we speaking about um, New Hampshire wholesalers? Because if so, then I think they would need to be referred to uh, properly as, as to who they are within our statutes so that they be, can be correctly identified. By including these um, businesses within the direct, direct shipper fee, uh, excuse me, direct shipper statute, uh, 
if you are a wine manufacturer within the state of New Hampshire and you want to do this, you're going to have to pay a fee of $100 because that's what's in the statute. That's what the fee is for wine manufacturers. If you're an importer or a retailer, and retailers are not defined either because we, I think we all presume we know what a retailer is, but for the purposes of interpreting the statute and applying the statute, we would probably want additional clarity as to who would be in that class. Under the current fee requirements, a retailer, now that could be on-premise, could be off-premise, we don't really know, um, could be restaurants, could be anybody. They would have to pay a fee of $500 to obtain this. Uh, and I, as why I think- is I that, Why would their fee be higher? That's just the fee schedule that the legislature has put in place. In, in for the direct shipping. In other words, I, the way I read this is that you're getting a direct shipping license over and above whatever license you already have. Correct. And, and so and, people, right now the direct license, we don't we don't vary that, that license fee based upon the type of this is this is this is the fee, these are the fees that are applied to businesses who apply for a direct shippers permit to ship into the state. By including this language and by making, in my opinion, by making this statutory provision applicable to in-state businesses, you don't relieve them of the fee requirements. You essentially expose them to the fee requirements. Right. You also expose them to the limitations on the quantities that they can ship. Right. And go ahead, sir, I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, so by including them here, this, um, it, it certainly can be done. It, it, I, was, I would think it would need further clarification um, within the definition of eligibility for 17827 so that the commission could apply it um, uh, clearly. Um, I'm not sure, Mr. Chairman, if it's appropriate at this time to mention that there is another bill, um, Senate Bill 125, which is yet to appear before your committee, in which this issue is addressed from a, pro from a perspective of intra state shipment, a separate and distinct approach to the shipment of alcohol within the state by New Hampshire licensees. So we okay. have that. 125 is, is also a direct shipping bill also. It has a I piece heard, of that. I've heard a lot of stories about 125, so I don't know what's yeah. in it. <laughs> it, it, has a, it has a piece of that in it. A piece in it, okay. And, and within that, um, there would be no charge for licensure. A current licensee could for be- For a current a, licensee in New Hampshire to, to obtain a direct shipment. So, so, so you're suggesting then that, that, that um, maybe this amendment, the problem with this amendment is, is that there's gonna be an action added fee to it, but that if uh, in 125, um, everyone would still be able, does that include rectifiers and nanos in 125? Uh, it does not. Um, it would, again, <laughs> uh, subject to whoever drafted the amendment uh, and who they wanted to include. Um, if you're looking for the broadest possible um, application, then I think the eligibility pieces in both this bill, uh, Senate Bill 14 as amended uh, with RSA 17827 and Senate Bill, uh, and the other Senate Bill 125 would also need to be examined to make sure that the definitions were broad enough to include the class of licensees that you would like to see uh, eligible to participate. Okay. All right, well, the good news is we have plenty of time to figure that out before this bill has, these bills have to be added to committee. Uh, we do have a couple of hands up. Um, we'll start uh, with uh, Representative Weston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to mention that when uh, Mr. Moore uh, read the amendment, he did say that the, he did use the word may apply for a direct shipper permit, but this amendment does say shall, which to, in my mind means that they would be required to do it, whether they needed to or not. 
So I know there's a lot of problems here and that it sounds like we'll be working on this anyway, but I was just curious that right. that the the way it was read was different from what I have on my paper. I, clearly the shall, the shall must be in the statute. That, that's, shall is already in the statute. Um, and I think that it, it was really, as someone who wrote this bill, wrote the law, um, I would say is the shall was saying that if you wanted to ship into New Hampshire, you shall get a direct shipping license. That was what the shall in meant. Not that you had to get a license, whether you wanted to or not, is it's only if you wanted to ship into the state of New Hampshire. That's what that shall means. Okay, thank you. But I agree with you that it, it obviously we would not want to force someone to get a license they don't want or pay for it. So, Representative Herbert. Um, thank you, Chairman Hunt. Um, all I'm interested in is some direction as to Number one, uh, how much time and then what are we going to do in order to get a finished product uh, uh, successfully uh, made? I don't have any clue. I, I mean, obviously there's, it sounded like a half a dozen to a dozen uh, things that uh, attorney Moore uh, pointed out as problematic. So, um, and we have a, another bill, which is a Senate bill and I'm, I'm, I'm basically very confused. So I, I would appreciate it if the chairman, uh, Chairman Hunt could uh, kind of lay out a roadmap uh, as to how we're going to uh, uh, get this bill in shape for uh, a vote. Well, obviously I, uh, um, I originally had hoped to have Senate Bill 125 today, but uh, unfortunately it didn't, didn't get to us. So yet, <laughs> so, um, and for whatever reason, so I don't know if there was, you know, what was the issues going on in the Senate? Did, did the Senate, when, did Senate Bill 125 actually pass the Senate yet, Attorney Moore? I believe it has, sir. Okay, so um, we'll schedule that hearing. And then basically, you know, we'll, we'll um, I, I, as much as I don't want to do subcommittees per se, um, I guess we would, uh, you know, need to do a uh, straw, poll, see how everybody feels. I would assume that everyone here is okay with allowing New Hampshire businesses to take advantage of the direct shipping laws. Unless if somebody thinks differently, then, you know, I think you, you know, that, that uh, they'll, they'll need to voice that opinion. Um, but that, you know, that we all would want them to be able to take advantage of the law uh, in law, as long as it's enforceable, enforceable and done right. Uh, and I'm sure they would like to do it without an extra fee. <laughs> so um, if that's what's in Senate Bill 125, that sounds like that might be the way we're, we'll end up going. But uh, in either case, we'll have, we'll have both these bills and discuss. Um, but in terms of when uh, everything has to be out of, out of the committee, it, our deadline is May 27th. So we, we literally have uh, practically the whole month of May to, to figure these things out. So. Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Aiden. I was wondering if I could ask you a procedural question. Certainly. Uh, where the amendment uh, introduced by Representative Tusik is now part of Senate, uh, Senate Bill 14. Yes. Um, will they be considered together? Um, and certainly, certainly the underlying bill is very important to the commission. Um, and I'm not sure uh, if you feel oh, they need to remain together. Yeah, uh, yeah that, oh. just, to, to, uh, just about you know, five minutes ago. Voices in the background here. I don't know yeah. where that's coming that's from. The, somebody needs to, somebody yeah. needs to uh, mute. Yeah. Okay. okay. Pam, Pam, is that you need to oh, mute? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say in my personal opinion, um, if that if direct shipping is in Senate Bill 125, my preference would be to take it up in that bill. That way, I don't have to decide whether there's germane or not. Okay, in terms of uh, the issue, um, clearly uh, this this bill is a direct shipping bill, but it was a it's a bill that is directly just at the uh, commission and not licensee. So um, I see Representative Lang would like to probably weigh in here. So um, I would say on the face of it, um, uh, we would work with them together. 
but if if um, I could if we can get it worked out in Senate Bill 125, then that would be a good thing. Um, I just know that there are some people who have had concerns about 125, so I would be concerned whether some of the other issues that are in that bill and whether that would also baggage this, you know, that this issue would not happen if it was in that bill. So in that case, um, then I would want this issue to be in Senate Bill 14. So I, I guess we I, I want to wait till we do 125 and see where we are with that bill. Um, for now, I'll let Representative Lang testify, and then unless unless Connie, you have a specific question to me, or or you have a question for I me? I do. Yes. Um, just to clarify the answer that you gave, Aiden. At this point, the two are separate. The amendment and the bill are not married. The right, amendment right. needs to be accepted before it becomes a part of it. So there is the underlying bill is still clean as far as amendments go. Am I correct? Right. That is Thank correct. You. Thank you. Okay, Representative Lang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. I apologize for being late. I was running a little behind this morning. Um, thank you for letting me testify again. I, I, I brought this amendment, um, work with uh, Representative Petuchik, um, because again, I, I was felt it was important that New Hampshire breweries and, and, and uh, liquor distributors licensees be uh, on par with out of state. They should not be, you know, hindered uh, what out of state people can do. And, and the, in writing it in this met way, one of the things that's happening now is that, again, the Liquor Commission and the attorneys have to align the definitions that are in this with our New Hampshire statutes to make sure the, per the licensee in the other state qualifies under these definitions, whether a wine manufacturer or beverage manufacturer. And I'll note that the, the title of uh, Senate Bill 125 is relative to be beverage manufacturers. So they're already making those determinations as to what licensees fall into what categories. Um, again, th th this is a parity bill. It just brings New Hampshire businesses in parity with uh, out-of-state businesses. We should not be hobbling or hindering uh, our in-state businesses and giving preference to out-of-state businesses. Um, and that is it. I will say that 125 does have a whole lot more to do with, you know, defining uh, beverage manufacturer licenses, quantities of alcohol that they produce, and there's a whole lot more rather than a direct conversation around, do we want to allow our uh, New Hampshire um, uh, alcohol licensees to be able to direct ship with interstate, intrastate rather than uh, just interstate. Um, and that they should be, able, my opinion is, they should be allowed to capture New Hampshire market as well as any out of state market uh, through the direct, sh direct shipping model. And, um, and I'd hope the committee would adopt this amendment and, uh, and, and move the bill forward. Even if it's flawed with that shall being misinterpreted? Well, again, I, I, if, I, if I understood the conversation, the shall is that if they want to participate in direct shipping, uh, they shall obtain a license and the license fee is $100, it sounded like. And, and I'm okay with that, to be honest with you. I mean, if, 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 if you want to further amend this bill to, to take that, uh, if it's a New Hampshire licensee has already paid for a licensee uh, uh, for a license, that they, the fee can be waived. I'm completely okay with that. Um, but again, the idea is right now they can't even participate um, in a in meaningful way. Okay, so we have two different issues here. One is we, you know, we want them to be able to do this, okay? And the question is to be able to do this, is it, what is the best way to do this? So we go look at their statute and their license and put it in there versus putting it in this section, which would mean they would have to pay an extra fee. So my take would be is they would probably not want to be in the statute if we could put it somewhere else so that they would not have to pay an extra fee. But um, I'm not sure of that because the purpose of the fee is the administrative costs of the direct shipping program. Um, which one of the things we heard yesterday was that LBA thinks the commission is dropping the ball uh, because they haven't figured out how to make sure that you know, there's no illegal shipments into the state and that people are doing everything properly. So uh, there might be some question that the fee is not enough. So this is open for discussion either way, going that way. But I would tell you, Representative Lang, um, before you get you know, so pushing this language about why you know they only a fairness issue, um, I introduced I sponsored this bill over 20 years ago, 20 years ago, okay, and no one, 
no one in the state of New Hampshire has ever come up to me and say, gee, we really would like to be able to direct ship inside the state. And the reason being is, is that the consumer is now going to have to pay an 8% tax. So I would think that most consumers would probably try to, if not stand, not standing COVID, obviously COVID changed everything where we weren't shopping anywhere. But the idea that, um, you know, we don't even have a bottle bill in the state, the idea that now you're going to charge 8% for that, for that very exclusive, whatever product you're buying beer, uh, I always thought was a, um, a, a, a deterrent from wanting to do business that way. And that if the product is made in New Hampshire, it certainly should be available to buy in New Hampshire without an 8% tax added to it. I fully agree, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and again, I, uh, part of this was brought to me by the industry itself. So they're at least wanting the option. And this is the chapter they were, they, they brought to me and said, could you look at this? And then I went around and asked around at some of the, uh, I, have a, I have a brewery right in my, in my community and I went to them and chatted with them. Um, and they were, they were okay with that. So again, I, I would tell you that um, the industry itself is the ones that brought this forward because at least they want the option that they don't have right now and they're willing to pay for that option. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Any questions uh, for um, Representative Lang? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, oh, excuse me, Representative McLear, you have a question? I see. You there, Chris? Oh, no, okay, no, all right, it's gone. Uh, okay, so I have seen no hands up in attendees, no panelists, okay. So I guess we've fully discuss this issue. Um, and we have four people in support, no opposition to Senate Bill 14. And with that, oh, well, I do have a hand up now. Uh, Kevin Daigle, uh, I'm gonna promote you, Kevin. And representing the grocers. And you just have to unmute yourself and you'll be good, Kevin. Great, thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Kevin Daigle and I am the Vice President of the New Hampshire Grocers Association, representing convenience stores, supermarkets here in the state of New Hampshire. Um, I'll start by saying um, we have not seen the amendment. Um, and we were not planning to speak to the underlying bill, uh, but do want to speak to the amendment, which does not appear to be related to the bill itself, as you guys have discussed. Um, while we might understand the desire for parity across all licensees, the broadening of the statute could very likely have some unintended consequences, including direct impacts and economic consequences for our retailers and a significant disruption of New Hampshire's longstanding three-tiered system a system we fully support and believes works well. Um, we're not comfortable making this change until it can be thoroughly vetted, um, though that's something it says you guys are, are looking at doing. Um, and we'd urge the committee at this stage to defer any action on the amendment until there's a better understanding of its intent and ramifications. Thank you. Um, so Kevin, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, sure. my, my question to you is, um, so given COVID, I, I've been using uh, Instant Cart for doing my grocery shopping. And I know that both Hannaford and Market Baskets are listed there. Um, and don't, don't uh, can I buy beer through my Instant Cart in, from, from a grocer? I believe you can. Um, it's part of their um, license as is. Um, so they just need to be able to have that license with them if they're doing the home delivery. Right. And whatnot, and then making sure the delivery driver is a certain age. Okay, so uh, and obviously they can do that without the eight percent tax. Correct. Do you really think an eight percent tax uh, is going to hurt you economically when someone is going to buy it? I guess directly from the you know manufacturer, good the beverage manufacturer. Yeah. Uh, why why would they want to pay an eight percent tax when they can buy it for you for with no tax? Right. Well, I, I agree. I mean, they should be buying it from us. Um, not seeing the amendment. Um, the, war, the language that we had seen tossed around included everybody. I mean, so this would also allow distributors to sell direct to a consumer. Um, uh, distributors have always had that right. As a matter of fact, I, I, I was uh, I, I was remembering the old days when whenever I wanted you know for 
college when I didn't want to get a keg, you the place to get the keg was going directly to the distributor. Distributors have always had the, the right to, to sell. Now, whether they direct ship, no, they'd probably be more than welcome to, to deliver it right to your door. Exactly. Uh, and, and they would have that right to do that. So they, right. they don't even need the shipping because they can deliver it to you. Uh, and so I'm a, I'm a little confused why Senate Bill 125 is a beverage manufacturer bill. But again, uh, I, I, um, we'll see that when we, when we get it. Right. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Now, oh, I have another hand up. And so, Rep Representative McLear, you now have a question? Your hand is up, Chris. Yeah. You have, you have a question, Chris? Yes, I, I, I dropped out and uh, <laughs> you're back. I knocked out somehow, and I'm trying to get back in, and you're, I'm not showing up. Uh, well, we don't see your smiling face. That's true, but we see you, and you got a square. So you just have to turn on your video. If down it, on, my my maybe not because didn't you, well. That's right. You had it was the internet. I just moved him in, so he should be oh, able. because he was an attendee again. He okay. was an attendee again, right? But I saw him on my screen here. But I don't know when you allow him to talk when he's allowed to talk as an attendee he shows up on the screen but he's still an attendee so now he's a panelist you know just when i thought i had this thing down there was <laughs> that's tricky <laughs> okay okay there you are beautiful right. i can see i can see the uh the the, the uh, ship behind you all right okay so is anybody else would like to speak on um Senate Bill 14, seeing none, then now I will officially close the public hearing on Senate Bill 14. And how are we doing for time? 10 o'clock, so we must be behind now. So that's probably not planned when I scheduled this. You're okay. doing well. Doing okay. Thank yeah. All right, the reason I schedule these bills in the morning so that everybody has afternoon so they can go do something fun since the weather is supposed to be nice. So, but not necessarily tomorrow. It's weather, afternoon weather, but. Tonight, today will be a good day to get out. All right, Senate Bill, open up the public hearing on Senate Bill 17, brew pubs allowing customers to bring dogs to the outdoor. This looks familiar too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, this bill is um, my sheets for, um, okay, and who's my Senator here for this one? Regina Bartzell. Oh, again, Regina, there you are, Regina. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> have you been on the whole time? That's great. So, I have good. been, actually. I've been listening. Okay, good. <laughs> but you're um, not on the Commerce Committee, so you can't help me tell me what's going on with Senate Bill 125. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. But I can look at the calendar and let you know what happened to it. Okay, we'll see what happened. Yes. Okay, so um, go ahead and introduce um, this Senate Bill 17. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, my name is Regina Bertzell, State Senator for District 19, which encompasses the towns of Derry, Hampstead, and Windham. And I'm here to introduce uh, Senate Bill 17. Uh, I'm the prime sponsor, and it's relative to brew pubs allowing customers to bring dogs to the outdoor areas and enabling, um, and the second part is enabling nano breweries and brew pubs to enter into contracts with contract brewers. I will speak to the first part, and I think Senator Sherman is on. He, um, in on paragraph, the new paragraph two, he will probably speak to because that's his, um, his amendment that we added to my bill. So uh, basically what the uh, prime bill was to allow um, with the municipalities um, adoption of an ordinance allowing brew pop, uh, allowing person to hold brew pub license, it allows the brew pubs to have um, uh, their customers bring their um, dogs to the brew pubs, but only in the outdoor patio areas. I believe this passed the Senate last year, and I think it might have passed the House, but I can't remember. But it, again, it got lost in uh, the Senator Petuchik is, I mean, Representative Petuchik saying no. So <laughs> I definitely passed the how the Senate, and um, I think it got lost in the omnibus bills last year. So uh, that's my portion in a nutshell. So uh, this issue has passed the House uh, uh, in past years, not okay, and it did pass this committee, um, but it wasn't limited to just. 
uh, brew pubs. It was open to all restaurants that have outside outdoor seating. And the issue was that um, we definitely don't want the dogs indoors because that could be Correct. a conflict with uh, um, dogs that are, are, have, a, are, have a mission. And um, so that it would only be outdoors. And, but it was, so can you address why you're doing brew pubs and not all restaurants that have outdoor seating? Well, it does have, um, it does amend 466. And I, um, and I looked at 466 colon 44, and it looks like it does, uh, restaurants do allow them on the patios, but it may just be the owner's dog from what I was, um, was yes. reading. Uh, Representative so. Butler's bill, yes. <laughs> 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 but, uh, I'd be open to amendment <laughs> allowing, but um, I wanted to start um, with a small bite of the apple with brew pubs. Okay, well, take a little little step, <laughs> small paw, baby. <laughs> yes, small puppy paw. paws. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have any questions for Representative Burso? Yes, Rep Representative Burrows. Yes, thank you for taking my question. Um, Senator, was one of the motivations for this um, bill uh, in terms of the dogs um, to actually increase business because you have a lot of people traveling with their dogs now and going out to eat, so it would actually benefit the, um, these establishments financially? That was, uh, that was a piece of it, but the prime reason was I actually had some brew pubs come to me and they had lost uh, customers because um, HHS came in and told them they couldn't have the dogs on the patios. So uh, some of the brew pubs did come to me and ask me to um, change the or add this to the RSAs to allow that so that they can um, their customers can bring their their uh, dogs. Thank you. You had me at Wolf. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Representative McLear. Um, I assume that this means the dog must be on the leash. Is that written into the uh, law? I believe um, that would be a local ordinance. And I think it, I've actually been reading some of the uh, comments on some of our community pages. And I believe it's actually a state law that dogs have to be on leashes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, you're right, we've heard this before. Um, and some of the issues that, that I have with this mirror what the um, DHHS sent out to us with um, objections, such as um, you can't control where a dog defecates or urinates, whether it's out on a patio, who cleans it up? There's you know, nothing that, that presents this. Um, would the staff of the restaurant be responsible? How would other customers deal with um, a dog that was aggressive? Um, would there be, uh, would the owner of the business have the um, ability to deny a customer that was there with a dog if there was a, a problem with that dog? Um, would they be liable um, if they determined that the dog was aggressive or not behaved, was uh, uh, affecting other dogs? Um, that could be in the area. I mean, there's there's a lot of other questions that are not addressed in this bill. Um, and I, I, my own opinion is that there are um, public safety and sanitary issues when you have dogs around food. Um, and I just don't think that the, that, I mean, how, how, how does this bill address some of those concerns? I appreciate your your uh, comments and your question, and I, I think what would happen is, and it it, I mean, if you go to Portsmouth, they al they allow dogs on the on the patios. I think it would be a local ordinance that if the town or the city wants to add that um, that capability to allow their brew pubs, and it's really up to the brew pubs to address, go to the town, the selectmen or the um, council and say, we, this is what we'd like to do. And then they need to work out an ordinance that would work for them. Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Van Howard. Um, 
Thank you. I was just going to ask a little bit of something along the same line as to how we can um, make some of these issues go away a little bit. I, I personally own the cutest little puppy. She's adorable and sweet, but she um, she's a pain in the butt. And so I would not want to subject someone having a nice hamburger on a nice sunny day and a, and a beer uh, to, to, to her cuteness. And, and yet I do respect the idea that pet owners with pandemic puppies and such are, are out there and are looking for ways to incorporate their pets and their social lives a little bit more. So I guess my question is, are you aware of any means by which we can facilitate localities coming up with ways to make it easier for nano brewers to have these, pup, these, these pet uh, possibilities? Well, thank you for the question. And I, I have to agree. I mean, I have a 11 month old standard poodle puppy. And at this point, I would not bring her to a brewery. I would not even bring her to Home Depot at this point until she gets she gets a little bit more trained. But again, I think it's really the agreement between the nano breweries and uh, nano breweries slash restaurants, however, it- Brew pubs, brew pubs. Brew pubs. Um, for them to to for them to negotiate uh, a standard for their locale with the town uh, council or the um, selectmen. Thank you. I realize, I realize this is a difficult question, but thank you for tackling it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the statute, you know, the bill uh, specifically says a municipality may adopt an ordinance. So so obviously the municipality will will weigh in. And it does, I was looking at it as a, um, having, having advising patrons that dogs are allowed on the premise um, in other states and in, in Colorado, the one I'm thinking of in particular where a lot of people have their dogs outside. Um, the sign, uh, the sign else says, well-behaved dogs are permitted. <laughs> exactly. So, That's uh, why mine won't go anywhere near one. <laughs> so I, I assume <laughs> that uh, municipalities have given the authority to the owner to uh, address the issue. Um, and uh, for someone who lives in a summer community who uh, requires everyone to pick up after their dog, um, and we're, we're pretty well equipped to handle what they leave behind. So um, any other questions from the committee members for the Senator? Seeing none, we thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next up is another senator uh, who uh, also has an amendment onto this bill. So uh, Senator Sherman, you want to introduce your portion of this bill, please? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Okay, uh, good, uh, good morning. And um, I just, uh, I appreciate Senator Birdsell well, let me, for the record, my name is Tom Sherman. I'm state senator for District 24, which is 11 towns on the seacoast with multiple brew pubs. Um, and uh, I just want to thank Senator Birdsell for working with me to allow me to attach this amendment to, the, uh, to her bill. Essentially, this uh, amendment affects two different levels of breweries, nano brews and brew pubs. Um, as you, um, I'm sure, are aware, Mr. Chair, the idea of adding contract brewers to our repertoire in New Hampshire is something that occurred a few years ago. And when I talked to the Beverage Association and others, they said it seems like it was a little bit of an oversight not to include nano breweries and brew pubs. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, in my district, there is a brew pub called Wim Brewery. And they approached me as they were looking to expand their capacity, but the cost of the overhead locally would have been prohibitive. Uh, they could not do tenant brewing, which is allowed um, just from a logistic standpoint and the overhead that would be involved in that. However, so they were able to find- Sorry, Tom, you want I'm to explain sorry? the difference between tenant and contract? So people understand sure. the question. Yeah, so uh, I'm not super expert on this, but I will do my best. Tenant brewing, is contract brewing is where you give your recipe to an, a operating large brewer and they will actually brew to your recipe and your specifications on contract. 
Correct. Tenant brewing is where you go into a similar facility that has more capacity, but you bring in your own people, your own, you're basically using their equipment. Um, so currently tenant brewing is allowed for nano pubs and brew pubs. Um, but it, again, as you can imagine, it requires a significant investment in overhead and personnel to do that. So what contract brewing would allow in both of these is say you have a barrel a month production, which is not much. You have a very popular recipe and you want to increase your capacity. You're basically testing the waters. You're thinking about a future investment. It's much less expensive to do this through a contract brewer where they will actually create your recipe uh, at your specification, the amounts you want, um, and then you bring it back and sell it at your brewery or at your brew pub. That way, if it takes off, then number one, you have some funds to reinvest locally into your brew pub or nano brew. Uh, and number two, you know that some of the risk is less because it actually is successful. Um, the other benefits of the concept of allowing contract brewing, staying completely within the limits that are already imposed on nano brews and brew pubs, uh, is that the nano brew and brew pub, as I said, will be able to expand capacity without a huge financial risk. The contract brewers like it because they typically will put you in in places where they have gaps in production. So it's not that uh, you're competing with their current production times. My understanding is that they, they are able to fill out their, uh, their times when the, when the brewery is not actually producing and they can fill in those gaps. The third is that the customers have more accessibility to your product. And the fourth, of course, is that the state sees the increased revenue of increased production. Um, so the bill is, or the, the amendment is fairly simple. It uh, allowed, the, the, the biggest hurdle in working with the Liquor Commission was how do we know if somebody is starting from scratch how do we know what the production levels are? And we wanted to be sure that we stuck with the spirit of brew pubs and nano brews, which is that you're brewing on site. So two of the requirements you'll see in the, in the amendment are number one, they have to continue to brew on site. Uh, and it has to be at the level they were brewing on site prior to on an annualized basis, prior to contract brewing. Second of all, if they're starting from scratch, you just can't do it. You have to establish your level of production and it has to be at least um, 10 uh, barrels per year, which isn't a lot, but it, it would allow uh, pretty much every nano brew or brew pub that wanted to contract brew, it would allow them that capacity. And certainly Wim Brewery, which has a very tiny facility in Hampton would be able to meet that that uh, uh, that hurdle of 10 per year. Um, again, it respects the spirit of brew pubs and nano pubs where you have on-site brewing. It respects the current limits to production, um, but it allows expansion of these, um, um, these small businesses without putting them at uh, enormous financial risk. And I, I'm not sure if WIM will be testifying today. I hope they will, but their estimate just to get up to uh, uh, a fraction of what they can do with contract brewing was going to be a 350 to $500,000 outlay in capital. So that was a big concern uh, for, a, for a small operation. Um, so with that, I will stop my testimony and happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, uh, we do have some questions. <laughs> Representative Bartlett is first. Oops, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Annoying. Um, Senator Sherman, um, now I, 
I, I had asked um, Senator Birdsell about um, this being an enabling um, bill. And, and she answered that, you know, that's what the intent is here. And so we're getting into a lot of detail about the difference, you know, between an brewery and who's, who can do this. But my concern really is about the fact that the state is promoting um, the ability to bring dogs onto a eating establishment premise. Okay, well, Reve uh, Senator Sherman is just here for the, for this piece with the dogs we're, we're that's for aside for the moment, but he's he's here for discussing just this contract brewing for brew pups. But this is the amendment to the dogs. Uh, in the Senate's mind, this is a now an omnibus bill that has multiple. Oh. <laughs> I, boy, I got lost there along the way. Um, so I've not seen the amendment, and I looked in my email. Oh, this is not an amendment. This is in the bill. This is actually in the bill now. It's part Senate, two of the bill. The Senate, the Senate well, it, yes, it'll actually okay. section, section three of the bill. <laughs> so it's, uh, so yeah, so they, they, they you know, we'll get, buckle your seatbelts. We're going to see a little more of this when we see Senate bills, that there are going to be multiple issues in, in the bill. Thank, thank you very much. No problem. Yeah, fine. <laughs> Representative uh, Weston. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Sherman, for bringing this. I, I did sort of zero in on the production levels when I was reading this, uh, because being somebody who's not in the business, uh, I was curious about the, the limits, the lowest limit and the highest limit. And I noticed that the difference between the, um, the brew pub, pubs and the nano brewer were different, and I'm wondering if um, the, the brew pubs are allowed to produce more than the nano brewery. And I'm wondering if you could tell me why that is. Uh, I would love to, except that we didn't change that. that uh, that's existing statute. The, the limits of production are, um, perhaps the chairman will remember. Well, I, I, I would say, I would clarify that even though the title of the bill does say nano, this section of the bill only talks about brew pub. No, I, actually, I'm sorry. It, it actually does address both nano breweries and brew pubs. No, it does. Neither of them, right. Neither of them had the capacity to contract brew. And so the concept is that nano brews and brew pubs are very similar in structure. They actually are sit in different you know, very close to each other in statute, but they both have the same concerns is that, uh, you know, they are typically very small operations with limits on production, but being able to put in the investment to expand is, is a combination of risk and um, finding the capital. And so the ability to contract through allows them to test the waters at a lower overhead. Um, they both currently, as I'm sure you know, Mr. Chair, they have similar structure and statute in that they can both tenant brew, they can locally brew, and all this does is for both of them, it gives them the capacity to contract brew um, okay. because they both face the same hurdle. Yeah, I see it now. It's so this section two of the bill is nano. Section three. Section three is brew pub. Uh, what really begs the question? This, then you know, brew. <laughs> you, you're taking two statutes who were born. How would I say this is uh, awkwardly from uh, what we had, which was a beverage manufacturer, and the brew pub was a cute idea that that someone who was really going to make that big investment to put in the big tanks and everything because they thought people would like to watch it being made and watch that whole process. And you're saying, well, yeah, that's why we have that license, but they really don't want to do that. They, they just want to make a barrel a day there and the rest of it's going to be somewhere else. Okay. I guess I don't feel so bad given that Proof Ups pay the highest license. They pay a cocktail beverage license, all right, uh, so that for that privilege. But when you start throwing in nano, nano, the license is low, 
The V is low, the volume is low because it was supposed to be where you were experimenting and trying out something new. But to go and do it somewhere else, it, it defeats the whole purpose of what the nano was supposed to be about. Just my Understood. Opinion. So uh, I am not wedded to nanos because that's not the constituency that brought this forward. Did, did nano, were nano people involved in, that, in this or how did this get into the bill then? No, it was there because uh, in discussing this with uh, beverage manufacturers and others and the association, the feeling was that nano and brew pubs um, share the same concern about as they want to expand, as their recipes are popular, again, it is, you know, these are small operations and the ability to either get capital or raise capital to be able to expand is limited. So I absolutely hear what you're saying. Um, if you'll notice on the brew pub side, it was very intentional, the work I did and working with the uh, chair of the liquor commission to be sure that we kept the spirit of the brew pubs, which was the focus of this, the nano, which is that you have to have on-site brewing. It has to be at least at the level you were doing before. And, um, and, in, and you can't do it unless you start out and demonstrate the ability to do a certain level of on-site brewing. So I think that's all in keeping with the brew pub. The nano brew was added on as uh, at the request of others. Um, if you wanted to jettison that, you know, I wouldn't um, be seriously wounded. They'll be back but next year. The, either way, if we pass this bill, they'll be back next year. So I, I right, but but I think the on the brew pub side. Absolutely, we did everything we possibly could to keep the spirit of a brew pub alive. You know, if, if they stop on-site brewing, there's no reason they shouldn't go for uh, a production license and a restaurant license. That's, that's what they're doing. You know, they're doing production off-site and they're doing a restaurant. But a brew pub where it's combined, um, again, as you know, uh, it is a significant financial um, risk to expand and this would be a way to allow that to happen to the benefit of pretty much all parties including the customer the state the contract brewers and the brew pubs without and i i don't believe it violates the spirit of a of the of a brew pub i think it really does not meet that, that spirit i don't want to get in a running debate but as you know the brew pub is the poster child of throwing the three-tier system into the trash can and the whole running concept was that they are absolutely making investment into all those tanks and all that production right there on site. To say is that, well, you pass this, then that will help them out. No, I, I can visualize that they'll start pulling those tanks out and say, we, don't, we can use that space for more tables, <laughs> more customers, so, because we're brewing the stuff off site. So it, well, that's it, it, you know, yes. a, you know I, <laughs> so maybe we maybe need a new name for it's not really a brew pub. It's you know it's somebody who is a is an outlet of some brewing manufacturing that's going on somewhere else location. Well, just to answer that concern, they do have they can't pull that out and continue production on site at the same level they were doing it before. They just one can't. One barrel a month. One barrel a month is nothing. I know. Right, I but know, what I know home brewers that do more than that. But, but what I'm saying is that they have a certain on-site investment uh, and that on-site investment, they have to continue at at least that level or they have to change their license. They can't do it unless they continue that. And that's in the amendment. And that, but, but, that, but it does beg the question if you became a new brew pub, in other words, somebody who opening up a brew pub after this law is passed, they can have, a, have this minimum standard of one barrel a month and, and be doing it off site. And so it just seems a stretch to call it a brew pub when, when you have to go looking for the tanks. I mean, most brew pubs, the tanks are right there. They're these big, you know, silos and missiles that are parked right inside there. You're taking them out. So, anyway, I, I, I get it. I get it, uh, Senator Sherman. It's not that I'm opposed to the bill. I just, it just, it's just sometimes it's a wonder. Okay. <laughs> Representative Abel has a question. 
Uh, yes, this is a, a procedural question really for the chair, I think. Um, I just wanna clarify for myself and for everyone else about, uh, is there a word germaneness? Uh, I don't know, uh, but uh, it sound, if a bill comes to us uh, from the Senate and it has different parts, but they're not what the house would generally consider to be germane, we can accept that. But if we want, if we want to make uh, an amendment, introduce an amendment ourselves, um, do we have to divide the bill into two bills so that we're germane with the one part or do we just go, go, go forward um, because we're t dealing with two different issues here. So how, how, do, how, do, we how do we handle that? Um, well, clearly the House and Senate have different rules about germaneness and um, in the House, we, we require that if it's a non-germane amendment, it has to be hold a separate public hearing. But, uh, and that's true for everything except um, House Bill 2, which is allowed to be chock full of anything and everything. Um, we, uh, the Senate uh, uh, has in historically and in, in overwhelmingly the last session uh, have, uh, have put added bills to each other and, and, and they have decided again to do it again this year. And that's their choice. And if they send the bill over, we, we take the bill as is and whatever pieces, whatever sections we want, and we're free to um, add our own sections and or removing sections. And then we'll take it up in the committee of conference. And at that point, the committee of conference has to has to deal with only those things that are in those two different versions. They cannot introduce a new non-germane amendment at that point. Okay. Any other questions for Senator Sherman? Seeing none, we thank you very much, Senator. Thank Sherman. you. And thank you. let's see. I do have. Let me see. Where am I? Yeah, did you say, want something else? Say something? No, I'll get something else. Okay. Um, so let's see, where I have, who was going to speak on this bill? Um, so if someone else signed up to speak, would just raise their hand so I can find, okay. All right. Henry Veyu. All right. Where's Henry on this? Okay, you just have to unmute yourself, Henry. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Henry Veyu, and I'm here on behalf of the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association. Um, and we would just ask if uh, the committee is going to move this bill forward, um, that you expand the bill uh, to include all restaurants. Um, the House Commerce Committee last session uh, passed House Bill 1438, came out of your committee, uh, it went to the floor, it passed the House, and it was sent to the Senate, and then COVID came along, and the bill just went anywhere. It was laid on the table, and uh, the session ended, so it, it never made it all the way to the finish line. Uh, but uh, this committee did pass uh, the bill last year to allow, basically allow, um, uh, dogs in outdoor dining areas at restaurants. So uh, it would expand it beyond what this bill um, is looking to do, uh, which is just the uh, brew pubs. And that's it. Okay. And I would just add, Mr. Chairman, that I sent a copy of House Bill 1483 as passed by the House and Senate Bill 450 as passed by the Senate last year to all the committee members a, a little while ago. So you can, they are very different. 450 is identical to the first section of Senate Bill 17, but okay. um, that was part of the confusion, I think. All right. Yeah, I, yeah, I was a little fuzzy there. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions for... Henry, may you? Seeing none. Okay, uh, next up is Bob Levine. And I'm promoting you, Bob.
Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, my name's Robert Levine. I'm one of the owners of the Wim Craft uh, Pub and Brewery in Hampton, New Hampshire. Um, we're the ones that have the really small um, brewing facilities. Um, it allows us to brew basically one barrel a month. Um, we would like to expand um, finding the financing to equip us to a seven barrel brewery, which is what had been in our business plan, which would uh, satisfy uh, our brewing requirements would require an additional investment of $350,000 at a minimum. Just the equipment alone is 150,000, Never mind the expansion of space. Um, while we can tenant brew under the statute, um, tenant brewing is a long-term commitment, business commitment with an established beverage manufacturer uh, requires uh, federal registration and approval uh, and, and in more financial risk. As Senator Sherman explained, it, we would go in and utilize the facilities with our own personnel. It, it's, it's a much more intensive commitment uh, and business risk for us. Contract brewing, uh, which beverage manufacturers can do, and these are the people with the big equipment anyway, um, allows us to go in to a beverage manufacturer on a one-off basis. Um, it, our capital investment is, for example, uh, with, uh, we had contracted with Great North um, to do this and then found out that we weren't allowed to under the statute according to the Liquor Commission after we sent in the contract for approval. Um, that would cost us $10,000 and that would get us a 20 barrel run of probably one of our best recipes. And in that way we could test the market, see how uh, brewing on that production uh, level is received uh, without having to uh, make a, a much more intensive investment. It's a one-off deal. If it works out, we like the way that beverage manufacturer does that um, uh, production with our recipe. Uh, then we could continue to do so uh, without uh, the financial risk. It levels the playing field a little bit for us and nano brewers um, in order to enjoy some of those benefits without the additional cost. In no way, shape or form will we ever consider removing our brewing equipment on site that this is our business model. We could have chosen to, to be a restaurant. We didn't, we chose to be a brew pub. Uh, one of my partners is a brewer and that's what he wishes to do. He's our head brewer. Uh, so we asked the, the uh, committee to, to favorably look upon the, the amendment and the bill. Uh, and thank you, I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, there's uh, any, any questions from the committee members? Uh, seeing none, but thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, uh, so um, we'll change. Uh, see now, uh, David Dostal. David Dostal, Dostal. Dave, I'm promoting you up to, so you can testify. Good morning, and thank morning. you everyone for the chance to speak. Just give me a nod or a hand wave if my audio is oh, coming through. We, we hear you great. Excellent, thank you. Um, I did send an email to the committee, so I will try to keep this brief because hopefully uh, folks have at least scanned it. Um, I wanna make it clear, I like brew pubs, nano brews, I support it. I look forward to getting back into it uh, once we're able to. Um, and I think it's, it's a real shame that this very wise granting of contractual flexibility is entangled with a, a, a possibly more contentious issue, which is the issue of dogs in outdoor dining areas. Now, the issue of the sanitary uh, concerns and the HHS objections, that, that's a well-worn path. I think it's totally valid, but I'm not gonna bother to repeat it here. I wanna make some points that are, uh, I think also valid. And I also wanna, uh, yeah, so let me just get on with that. Um, there are plenty of people who want to allow dogs in the outdoor eating and drinking areas. I totally get that. 
and I get that, that f- people in favor of this are going to be very vocal and very enthusiastic. There's also a significant constituency of us who do not want this. But I think the problem is that many of us who don't want it are aware of the status quo, comfortable with the status quo, and not aware that there might be change on the horizon. So what I'm saying is that I think opposing voices are underrepresented because a lot of people are simply not aware of it. Um, and Representative Van Van Houten, um, with, with apologies if I mispronounce your last name, I think your you brought a nice perspective to this saying, I have a dog, I love my dog, I wouldn't bring my dog to a pub. Um, and and I, I definitely um, appreciate that. I think we, a lot of us have anecdotal experience of, of maybe one dog in an eating area, especially if it's a, a, a service dog, very, very highly trained, doing a job, causing absolutely no problems whatsoever. I think we need to look into our collective crystal ball and think about a scenario with multiple untrained non-service dogs that are in an eating area, surrounded by unfamiliar people, surrounded by unfamiliar dogs, with the noise, with the smell of food, with the people in charge of these dogs drinking alcohol, and ask ourselves, is this not a recipe for conflict and disturbance? Um, I I think it's just common sense that there could be a lot of problems. And I want to point out, uh, based on some of the discussion earlier in this session, New Hampshire does not have a leash law. If you read the statute very carefully, the New Hampshire state law says a dog simply must be under control which is widely interpreted by many people to be voice control. So expand the crystal ball here to a bunch of unleashed dogs because that's what this legislation would do. And let's ask ourselves the question, do do a lot of pub managers and do a lot of local police departments really want to be getting involved in what I, what I think are the guaranteed conflicts and the guaranteed problems that are gonna happen, especially when assertions about increased revenue, increased business are right. Uh, no guarantee. Um, To give a quick anecdotal example, I was on the outdoor dining patio at the Whaleback Ski Area in Enfield just this past weekend, and there was a a group at a table next to me with a dog on a leash. I went back to my car to change out of my ski boots, and as soon as I came back to my table, their dog on its leash was sitting there and nuzzling through my backpack trying to eat my snacks, and the response to them was, oh, you should kick the dog when it does that, and my response was, I will not kick a dog ever. It's cruel. And it's not my job to keep your dog out of my backpack. So anecdotal story, I don't want to get hung up on. I don't want to move on to reasons that don't have to do with whether a person likes dogs or doesn't like dogs. So please, please think of these as objectively as possible. When there's a pandemic, like now, and like, unfortunately, there probably will be in the future, people who don't want to eat around dogs do not really have a feasible choice to simply go inside and eat or drink without the dogs around. And even if we did, is it correct that one group of people should be empowered to displace another group of people for no good reason? Um, I think it's worth recognizing that dogs are extremely popular, no doubt, but the best statistics I've found, which by the way, were sponsored by pet food companies and pet accessory companies, still find that dogs are owned by a minority of US households. Now, being in a minority doesn't make somebody wrong and being in a majority doesn't make somebody right, but the point is, a large constituency should not be displaced by another constituency for for what appears to be no good reason. I think it's also true that we don't have a lot of outdoor pub space or outdoor restaurant space in the state of New Hampshire. And I think all citizens deserve to be comfortable using them. I think it's feasible for people with dogs to enjoy a pub without their dogs, but it's not feasible for some people to enjoy a pub when there are other dogs around. Allergies are a real thing. Uh, Fears and phobias are real things. And I think overall, it's just, it's just a shame that these two issues, the contractual issue and the dog issue are bound up together. And the dog issue itself, I think is far too loosey goosey. When you consider that we don't actually have a statewide leash law, what the proposal here is to open up outdoor areas to dogs and then let the towns retroactively make legislation and policy to address these problems after they've happened. That seems very short-sighted. I think if dogs are going to be allowed in outdoor spaces, then the parameters to make it successful need to be laid out ahead of time. And I do think they should be laid out by the state because I have experience at the town level of people saying, look, we're not comfortable making ordinances ordinances that go beyond the state standard. I think it would be best if there was some way to separate the very wise business portion of the bill, the contractual portion from the societal aspect about whether or not people want to or should be able to drink and eat around dogs. 
I don't know if it's possible for the bill to be split up. I don't know if it's possible for something like dog friendly dining to be restricted to a certain number of days per month so that each constituency can get what they want or something like that. But right now, this looks like it's far too vague, far too open ended. It doesn't have any specificity to it to set it up for success. And there's a large number of people who are opposed to it. Many of them are unaware, and that's why they're not being heard. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Uh, does anybody, uh, any members of the committee have a question? Uh, seeing none, we thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, so similar on this line, we'll now have uh, Colleen Smith from Department of HHS. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning, Chairman Hunt and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Colleen Smith. I'm the administrator of the food protection section within the Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm here to provide some background information uh, regarding the current regulations around the allowance of dogs and food establishments. So as, as alluded to previously, RSA 466 prohibits bringing animals into any restaurant or retail store that sells food except under two conditions, service to animals or a restaurant owner's own properly disciplined dog is, is allowed um, in non-food preparation areas, pro, um, provided there's proper notification to patrons that there is um, a dog on premises. Our food code, which we've adopted into our administrative rules, does not allow companion dogs on premises in food establishments. And there are several public health reasons that should be considered before approving expansion of this law to allow for an unlimited dogs amount of dogs to be present in a food establishment. Um, we are concerned that patrons or restaurant staff may pet or other hand, otherwise handle the dogs, contaminating their hands without washing them um, and then going on to prepare food or handle tableware for other patrons, the that the dogs may contaminate the chairs with their saliva or from dander or fur, which um, could also be an allergen to that may affect other patrons. And then also that dogs may have accidents that could contaminate the dining areas. And there's no provisions about protocols or procedures for who, who would be responsible and, and what would be necessary for, for proper cleanup if, should that happen. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have with regard to the, the current regulation. Uh, we do have a question, Representative Bartlett. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for coming to see us again, as always, um, Ms. Smith. Um, one of the things I'm wondering is is there any provision for um, whether a patron, if the if this kind of a bill were to be passed, whether the patron would have to um, carry insurance? What if this dog were to bite someone or another dog? Um, is there anything in this that um, currently that that um, would require the well would make the restaurant owner liable for one thing or keep the owner of the dog liable um, with insurance. So I, I am not aware that the bill addresses the, those two aspects. You raised for two very good points. Uh, they, those wouldn't be specifically addressed in our food safety rules, but, but I think you raised um, two points that should be also under consideration. Thanks very much. So do you have rules related now to dogs? I mean, like I know we have the, the pub, the, the, you know, not pub, but the bed and breakfast statute where we allow dogs. Do, did you guys ever generate rules along some of these issues? So the only allowances currently are around the, um, the specific carve outs related to, to service animals and then also the, the restaurant owner. There aren't specific rules within those. Um, it's, it's just covered within the statute that they're, that they're limited. I, I think what we, we hear often is that folks, um, you know, even though there is rules and uh, um, a statute in place around this issue is that Consumers still bring their dogs to places. We we deal with many many consumer complaints, um, several a month with regard to this issue. Not only restaurants, but into retail stores as well. Okay. okay. Any other questions from the committee members? Seeing none, we thank you very much for coming in. Uh, and last but not least is Aiden Moore from the Liquor Commission. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm really here to see if there are any technical questions that the committee members might have. And if not, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. So otherwise you're okay with the language in the, in the three sections of the bill? Well, we participated uh, as Senator Sherman indicated in working through some of the uh, issues dealing with um, the contract brewing pieces. Uh, so while um, I can't speak to the dog questions, uh, I'm certainly happy to suggest that uh, our, our cooperation with the Senator was a part of what was brought to you in his portion of the amendment. Okay, great. And you're willing to take questions, I hope? So, I'm certainly happy to take some. Representative Bartlett has a question. Thank you very much. And thank you for sticking around, Mr. Moore. Um, my question is, um, um, I don't know how many of these very, very small brew breweries that there are. Um, I think that as a rule, we try not to come up with bills that only apply to one or two businesses. Do you, in your experience, know whether there are there is a need for this bill because there are many of these one barrel a month breweries? Uh, thank you for your question, Representative. Uh, I, I believe you heard from the uh, owner of the uh, brew pub that they are, uh, and I believe they are the smallest manufacturing uh, uh, brew pub in the state uh, that their uh, uh, brewing capacity is, is probably the smallest. So I, I wouldn't pretend to suggest I know whether it's needed or not. Um, I think uh, Senator Sherman gave you compelling information about the business aspects of why they want to do that. And I think um, Representative Hunt uh, probably gave you a lot of good background information on the uh, political questions about brew pubs and nano brewers as far as uh, what they were put in place and intended to do. So uh, I would probably suggest that we really don't have a position on whether it's a good idea or not. And we'd certainly defer to the, to the committee to determine whether it's uh, an appropriate concept to move forward. Further question, may inquire. Thanks very much. Um, can you tell us how many of these very, very small um, brew, breweries are in New Hampshire? Well, when you say <clears throat> small representative, are you speaking about nano brewers alone or are you speaking about, I can get you statistics and numbers of the uh, different categories of manufacturers. So for example, we have a beverage manufacturer, which is a class of license on its own. Uh, we have brew pubs, which again are another type of license, and we have nano brewers. And I'd be happy to provide you with the exact number of those businesses. Um, I can't give it to you right now, but I'd be happy to get that to you today. I think that would be helpful. We'd like an idea of how many of these very, very small um, breweries there are in New Hampshire. I'll, I'll make sure you have that today, Representative. Thanks very much. Representative Abramson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, maybe this is more appropriate as a question for the chair, but I think the title is Relative to Brew Pubs Allowing Customers to Bring Door Dogs into Outdoor Areas and Enabling Nano Breweries to Brew Pub and Brew Pubs to Enter into Contracts with Contract Brewers. It, it seems like um, this is too completely different bills. I wonder if we're allowed to divide the question ourselves the, the way we would be allowed to on the floor. Uh, we are perfectly allowed to do whatever we want with this bill. Anything. Send it, to, send it out as add, two bills. We could add more things. Well, no, we can't send it two bills because then you would have to have another bill. So you can divide the question, like you say, on the house floor and vote for one issue and not the other. Um, but otherwise, uh, we can delete section two of the bill and, you know, say we don't want to put nanos in here. We can do anything like with that, but you can't create a separate bill. You would, you can, you can, you can add and subtract amendments to it. I, I'm just saying this, I guess it's a foregone conclusion. The second part of the bill 
shouldn't have any problems, but this first part about dogs in outdoor areas could jeopardize the second part of the bill. So I'm, I'm wondering if we can divide the question in committee. If you think it's that's important enough, we could certainly uh, delete that section of the bill. But then, and then, and then go stick it on a different one. <laughs> For instance, we could take Section One out of this bill and go throw it in Senate Bill One Twenty Five when it comes to us. You know, we can we can move things around like that. But um, you can't create a separate bill. Now you can't have a whole separate bill. They. For better or for worse, the Senate has has uh, tagged them together, and and I'm sure that that was around the conversation of of germaneness that that in both cases they were talking about group clubs. All right, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Attorney Moore? Well, you get off flight. Hey. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, seeing no more hands up, uh, anybody in the attendees, last chance? Seeing none, uh, there were uh, 12 people in support of the bill, and one person opposed, and one person neutral, which I assume that was the, that was Colleen. Okay, with that, I will close the public hearing on Senate Bill 17. And next up, is Senate Bill, uh, where are we? Senate Bill 66, allowing on-premise licensees to transport beverages and wines for delivery to consumers. Okay, so um, the sponsor or anybody, the attendees who want to speak, please raise your hand so I can see you. And so who's the sponsor of this one? It's just Senator French. French. Oh, Harold, you know what? And I got a call from Harold that, and I'm sure he must have called me to tell me that he could not be here to introduce the bill. <laughs> so, no, Representative Patusik, would you like to introduce the bill for Senator French? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would because Senator French also called me. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. And uh, for the record, Representative John Patusik from Rockingham 6, which is Derry, uh, standing in for Senator French. Uh, introducing House, uh, House Bill, Senate Bill 66 FN, which is, ah, let me quote this, for the record, allowing on-premises licensees to transport beverages and wines for delivery to customers. Uh, this bill allows an on-premise licensee to purchase a restaurant delivery license in order to deliver beverages and wine with food ordered for the on-premise licensee. Um, I read it. I understand it. Um, it is a result of COVID. And uh, if there's any technical issues, I'm sure uh, uh, Attorney Moore would be happy to address them. And uh, I will stand back at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, great. Uh, next, I see Jamie Burnett. Okay, Jamie, you're on. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, just out of respect for your time this morning, I know things are running a little late. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, we've testified. Uh, I've testified before on behalf of the Wine Institute on similar legislation in this committee. Uh, we, we fully support um, SB 66. We think it's a timely measure to help out um, restaurants and on-premises licensees that have been struggling during the pandemic. Uh, it certainly would help out uh, wine manufacturers as well, which we represent. And um, uh, we have provided written testimony to you. You have that. If you have any questions, I'll answer them. But um, we, we support the bill and hope you'll consider passing it. Great. Any questions for Jamie? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, now we have Brian Moran. Good morning, Chairman Hunt um, and members of the committee. My name is Brian Moran. I'm Director of Government Affairs for the New England Convenience Store and Energy Marketers Association. Um, uh, we represent about 900 convenience stores in New Hampshire and 655 which sell motor fuels. We employ over 
14,000 people. Uh, Nexima has commented on this bill several times before uh, in the Senate as well as in, in this committee. And, uh, you know, we certainly appreciate the, you know, intentions to, you know, provide some relief. And what we would like to suggest for the committee's consideration where we would not oppose the bill if three changes could be made. And the first would be, you know, given that we're trying to replicate the dine-in experience to go, we would recommend that the volumes of alcohol that would be allowed for to go under this new license category should be reduced, you know, from, from its current 19 12 ounce beverages or one and a half liters of wine to something that is more comparable to that dine-in experience. The second is, as it was amended in the Senate, it has a two-year sunset provision, and we would request that that be reduced to one year and believe that there's adequate time to be able to evaluate the utility and necessity of this license category going forward. Um, and along those same lines, we would request uh, that the new licensees under this category would be able to report, you know, uh, at some timely basis, you know, the, the beverages and wine volumes that were sold with the meals to go uh, to be able to determine whether this is truly ne necessary and of value. Uh, for this category as the, uh, uh, I, with the idea of evaluating this trial uh, and experiment going forward. Um, with that, I'd be open to any questions. Okay, um, any questions from committee members? Uh, I don't see any. Okay. Thank you. And does anybody else wants to speak other than Attorney Moore? Uh, I guess that's it. All right. Oh, well, oh, and, oh Mike Somers. Okay, there you go. I was wondering where you guys were. <laughs> okay, Mike, I'm promoting you up. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Hunt, uh, members of the committee. Uh, Record. My name is Mike Summers. I'm the president and CEO of the Nature Lodging and Restaurant Association. And just to give a little context, um, this bill, uh, the, most of the majority of this bill was actually filed in the early part of the 2020 session. Uh, Senator French had filed this bill on our behalf. We were pursuing this as something the industry would like to try. Obviously, then COVID hit and everything kind of went sideways on us, the industry, et cetera. And uh, the governor was kind enough to adopt this under an emergency order, which has allowed the industry to essentially experiment with this for the, you know, for the last year. So uh, we're here testifying in support of uh, Senate Bill 66. Certainly hope that you will, uh, will move this forward. We have two, two, two minor changes that we would request. And the two small changes are right at the end of page three, lines 18 and 19. Um, ultimately, what I think we have concern with is uh, the two-year sunset provision. Uh, as you all know, uh, certainty for industry is an important uh, factor. And so uh, if we're going to go through this entire process, it would make sense to us as the industry to make this a permanent right uh, and feature for the industry to, to pursue. And, and I will say that the, the consumers have responded uh, pretty positively over the course of the pandemic. As you know, uh, we were, we've had a very tough year, uh, stating the obvious. Um, you know that uh, you know we were closed for a number of months there, and obviously one of our biggest outlets, or our only outlet, was takeout and delivery. And a part of that, obviously, was uh, beer and wine as part of the you know a meal package. Um, so that certainly uh, has helped some businesses. You know, uh, there's uh, some folks that have said that uh, you know it's it's not that big a piece of business, and and frankly, they're right. It's not a huge piece of business for the industry, but. For those industry members that have pursued it, it's an important piece of their business. So, uh, you know, we would respectfully request that, that you move this forward. Um, and then, uh, so the two year sunset really is our biggest issue there. Oh, and the other piece that I would ask for is if we could, 
This, uh, this essentially allows that uh, it would take effect 60 days after passage. Um, one of the things that I would uh, urge you to consider is that if the emergency order is to expire, we don't know when that's gonna be, uh, it would make sense for just the uh, continuity if we could uh, pass this and, and have it effective as soon as possible so that uh, there wouldn't be any gap in the ability for businesses to have this in a business model. And again, it goes back to certainty that if you have the right under the emergency order, the emergency order expires, but then it kicks in as, an, as a right later on, uh, it's almost a guarantee that somebody's going to get caught selling in that in that gap, not knowing that they they weren't didn't have the right to do so. So we would just respectfully ask that we uh, uh, potentially move that to have it um, uh, upon passage. So I think that's uh, the extent of my uh, testimony, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Okay, we do have questions, uh, Representative Weston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure this question uh, really should go to Mike Summers. It's more of a general question. We recently discussed HB 593, which was about the um, delivery services like Grubhub and DoorDash. And I'm wondering how that their services would mesh with this new rule. Representative, thank you for the question. And frankly, this wouldn't affect those third party delivery systems. The way this is drafted, the only way that alcohol could be delivered, they would have to be delivered by an employee of the establishment. So whilst your third party delivery companies can deliver food, they would not be able to participate in, um, in the delivery of alcohol. And frankly, that was worked out in the early days. So late 2019, we had met with liquor, uh, liquor commission, uh, 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 attorney Moore was uh, a part of those conversations. And we had essentially talked through the uh, chain of liability, chain of custody and their concerns. And that's how we really established that it really needed to be an employee that was gonna deliver alcohol. So essentially they would be left out of this, uh, this piece of legislation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Burroughs. Yes, thank you for taking my question. Um, Mr. Summers, can you tell me if under the, the uh, emergency order. Is there a limit to the amount of alcohol that can be delivered? Uh, there is, uh, and it's my understanding that the amounts in the emergency order are uh, the same as in this bill, uh, but Attorney Moore would probably be the answer that could uh, definitely clarify that for you. Follow up, please. For the question you may inquire. Yeah, so my question is, do you agree with, um, uh, I believe it was Mr. Moore, um, who was advocating that um, the volume be limited under this bill? Do you agree with that? I don't. I think the, uh, the the limits that are in the bill, I think, make sense. And, and that's simply because if you're in a, uh, say you have a few friends over for dinner, you know, two bottles of wine is not going to go very far when, when you have five or six people in your home. So I think that, uh, you know, these are kind of reasonable amounts. I think this is manageable. Um, and I don't think it's an, a, a, an overly large quantity of, of, of alcohol, frankly. And I would also suspect that people are going to order based on the number of folks that are there, right? So they're not going to order the maximum every time. If it's a husband and wife having dinner, they're probably getting one bottle of wine, or maybe it's a four pack of, of uh, craft brews or something. But if you're having friends over, you may need the, the, the ability to order a little bit more so that everyone can enjoy a cocktail. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee members? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And Kate Fry, I'm so glad, Kate, you, you're going to weigh in today. And you're good to go, Kate. Just have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify. I had not signed up to testify. Um, as this committee knows, we have been opposed to versions of the bill of this bill because of our concerns around greater access to alcohol without necessarily providing any more resources to um, substance use disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery services. However, I was, we just signed in an opposition on this bill because we thought the Senate version and the exercises that we had gone through in the Senate was a fair compromise. Um, I think the two year sunset is something we really feel strongly about. We didn't realize that there was going to be a move to try to remove that today. Um, and so if um, the committee chooses to do so, then 
our uh, passive opposition would ex move to much more active. Um, I think that uh, we still don't have the data every time we ask really how many groups, how many restaurants are taking advantage of this? What is the volume? We've asked this several times. We haven't gotten an answer. Um, I think the move, the amendment gets us there a little bit closer. I would agree with the earlier testimony um, from Brian Moran that that third point that he requested would be something we'd be interested in knowing too. Really, what is the volume? What are we talking about here? Is this really making a difference? And if that's the case, then when there is time two years after and we really reevaluate this, we hear the data and then the legislature can decide. So I really encourage the committee to um, keep the bill as is, um, how it was given to you in the Senate and keep that two year sunset. So we can just really look at kind of real data and evidence-based um, policies regarding alcohol accessibility going forward. And I thank the committee. Okay, thank you, Kate. Oh, we do have a question. Representative Elman, you have a question for Ms. Fry? Yeah, I do. Thank you for taking my question. If the data shows that there are significant volumes, uh, would that show that the program to allow takeout alcohol is successful if the volume is high in the data? I think there's a number of things that we could evaluate if that was the case. If, if that is high, you know, if it's something that is working, sure, that's a great point. But do we also know from the data that there are um, appropriate stop gaps um, to make sure that this is um, not affecting, for example, minors or um, other populations, or are there other improvements we can make from the bill? But you can't make any of those decisions unless you have that data. Okay, any other questions for Ms. Fry? Uh, seeing none, we thank you very much. And I, all I have left is, uh, Aiden Moore. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate being able to answer any questions that uh, the uh, committee may have on Senate Bill 66. And uh, I'm happy to take those questions if you have any. So, Aiden, were you in the room when this two year sunset got stuck into this bill? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I did monitor the Senate hearing, and I think there was some. A question about um, from the Senate whether or not um, there was adequate data that would look at whether or not this was uh, something that they would like to change permanently. And therefore, uh, I believe the motion was put into uh, put a two year sunset into the bill um, so that the legislature could look at it one more time and determine whether or not it's something that they'd like to make a permanent public, public policy. I guess it begs the question, did this happen right after we put the two year sunset on the, on the DoorDash bill? <laughs> uh, I did not participate or listen to the DoorDash bill, but I would think that great le legislative minds think alike, so. <laughs> well, this is a totally different reason. Right, because isn't, right now, isn't the governor, we allowed to have this right now, that, that this is going on by a governor's order that the alcohol is being delivered? The, the order is, has been extended into, um, answer, I forget which representative posed the question, but the um, amount of alcohol in this bill is the same as what's allowed by the executive uh, order. The difference in one of the things that people are looking for as far as measurement is that moving forward, if this bill were to pass, now a business would be needing to pay an additional $250 fee. That's something they don't have to pay for now. And so therefore, we would be able to tell you precisely how many businesses were taking advantage of this because of the fact that they would have to pay the additional fee. And I think that would go towards providing um, data to the legislature, to New Futures, and other uh, groups who may be interested in determining whether or not this is a policy worth pursuing after the after the sunset period expires. No, that makes no sense to me because the fee is in this bill. So yes, they, that's correct. They that's are correct. signing up for the fee, right? So, so if they, if they when, when Mr. Somers says get rid of the sunset, uh, he's he's saying signing. I'm okay with the fee, you know, forever and ever. 
I can't speak for Mr. Summers, but uh, <laughs> I would, I would okay. certainly say he can speak for himself. If no, were. I understand that, but I'm just saying they're, they're, they don't seem to have, you know, it'd be one thing if, it were, if the fee wasn't there, but the fee is there. So, I, I, okay. Representative Van Houten has a question. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Attorney Moore. Um, assuming that some of these bills that we're talking about that we are seeing as pandemic driven, um, particularly in, in the area of liquor, um, were to remain, what kind of impact would there be on what we know of as our current three-tier system? Uh, thank you for your question, Representative. That's a, uh, a huge question. And I think uh, none of us really know exactly how that's going to shake out. Uh, there's certainly a number of changes that have been proposed, which um, my time with the state started in 1981 when I uh, first joined the Liquor Commission's Enforcement Division. And uh, during that time, there, has, there have been uh, continual steps to, um, I don't wanna say consolidate, but the, the clear and distinct lines between retail, wholesale and manufacturing have become blurred. Many of the things that were, for example, privileges enjoyed by the retailers are now enjoyed by manufacturers. Um, and some of the policies that are being moved forward, uh, they have yet to settle. And we really don't have uh, a clear idea regarding what the long-term impact will be. Certainly there is a concern about revenue for the state of New Hampshire and that the liquor commission is, uh, and the liquor alcohol business is an important source of revenue to the general fund as well as uh, public health issues. And I think New Futures and Ms. Fry's organization uh, certainly tries to keep their finger on the pulse of public health questions. So you've, you've uh, asked a great question and I, I would tell you, I, I really don't uh, have an answer that I could give you that would probably be satisfying the broader question you're asking, but uh, there has been a significant amount of legislation moving this session dealing with alcohol. And uh, some of the pieces mesh well, some of the pieces don't. And uh, that's the challenge, I think, for uh, the agency potentially to administer these, um, should they all pass. And I think probably the legislative services will be working hard to try to reconcile issues of, that may conflict or where there have been passed in two different places and how to resolve them. So. Uh, I've tried to be as responsive as I can to your question, Representative. I, I apologize if, if I have not been. And no, I realize the nebulous nature of what I've, what I've asked of you and I appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions for Attorney Moore? Uh, Kate, did you put your hand back up again? Did you? Yes, I just, I did this, sorry to bother the committee again, but I just thought that I just wanted to add some clarity on the question of where the um, two year sunset came and it was actually went back a year ago to when all of these omnibus bills happened in the Senate okay. and this was one of them. And because the Senate had gotten several calls and concerns about this, they had actually added in that two year sunset in the spring because that bill was uh, vetoed um, that didn't go anywhere. And so when the Senate had this bill again, they put back the piece that they had added in the spring. So I just wanted to add that for clarity. That made me feel so much better. Thank yes, you. so you don't have to I didn't want to, I didn't want to get into the community <laughs> conference and be battling over sunsets. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, so is there anyone else would like to speak? Raise your hand, please. Otherwise... Uh, we have, let's see where it is. So, um, and just briefly, Mr. Chairman, I want to uh, let you know that Representative McAleer had to leave the meeting and he asked me to, to uh, give his heads up. Okay. <laughs> yes, just let you know that he, he had an appointment. In case I was paying attention. Okay. Great. Right. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, this had uh, nine supporters, two opposed, no neutral. And oh, we do have another hand that just popped up. Uh, D. Clark. Okay. Uh, 
who are you? <laughs> and D. Clark, you want to introduce yourself? This is scary. Uh, you have to unmute okay. yourself. I, I think I did it. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Introduce, introduce yourself. I'm Doug Clark. I uh, own um, two restaurants in downtown Durham. Uh, okay. Cow Trattoria and Clark's American Bistro. Uh, I, uh, we located them both in Durham. Uh, we opened them in 2020, which uh, obviously turned out to be relatively bad timing. Um, we did call the governor's office to inquire about the last Main Street Relief Program and learn that new businesses would not qualify because we didn't have revenue in 2019. A representative of the governor's office, I'm telling you literally in quotes, told us we should have known better than to open rest, uh, restaurants during the, uh, in, uh, that environment. Uh, but I'm here mostly to make sure everybody knows that new businesses aren't really new. Uh, in most cases, it takes year to pl years to plan. In our case, we formed our LLC in 2000. Are you, are you talking about Senate Bill 107? Oh, yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're not there? We're not, we're not there yet. Just uh, oh, stay sorry. on the line, and, uh, but we'll get to you in a moment here. Okay. I thought okay. I was late, actually. Oh, okay. no, no, no. That's right. Sorry. Well, we used to have a little thing with a number, but okay. All right. So uh, we will okay, close wait. public hearing uh, to Senate Bill 66 and now open up the public hearing on Senate Bill 107. Uh, which you've already just got a little inkling of. So the sponsor of Senate Bill 107, who's the, do I have a Senate Senator? Okay. Senator Perkins Quok. Oh, oh, yeah, I just promoted her. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't think we've actually met yet, so I'm not sure I know how to pronounce your name. Senator. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Perkins Quoka. 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 Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you everyone this morning. Thanks for having me. Um, I can't really see this well. Okay. So because uh, you got a light, right? Oh, you got the yeah, sun. Yeah, I know. Right I, we don't join by video um, in the Senate, so I might just shut that off since I'm in the wrong spot. But okay. So thanks for having me this morning. Um, for the record, I'm Senator Rebecca Perkins Quoka from Senate District 21, representing the city of Portsmouth and the towns of Madbury, Lee, Durham, Newington, Newmarket, and Newfields. I am the prime sponsor of SB 107 relative to financial assistance for businesses affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Main Street Relief Fund was designed for Main Street businesses. Instead, many of these small local Main Street businesses lost out and it was large multinational chain stores that received the assistance we received from the federal government. Many local small businesses were unable to access the Main Street Relief Fund because of the arbitrary date imposed on their formation prior to May 26, 2019, and a requirement to produce financial statements from 2019. This unfortunately cut out a large segment of new small businesses, which fill new needs in our communities and create the most new jobs at a time when they were really struggling. SB 107 would ensure that newer businesses will be able to access any future relief funds regardless of their date of establishment because the newer the business, the more critical supporting it is. These new businesses invest in their business well before they can open, and often their opening is delayed due to various factors beyond their control, such as permitting, financing, title concerns, supply chains, or other items. It's important for us to support our newest small businesses by directing any future discretionary federal funding we receive as a state to these newest businesses. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to present SB 107. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. I've been meeting with a group of small business owners who missed out on the Main Street Relief Fund because they were too new, and I believe many of them are on this call and will be speaking. I also believe Senator Bradley is here to speak, and I would be grateful if he could be recognized next. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess just help me out here. Uh, so we're you're expecting more money is going to be funded and 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 this just doesn't say what the parameters are it just says they should get something is that am i reading this right 
That's right, Chairman. So the intent um, is obviously to leave the rulemaking, so to speak, uh, to Gopher because you know this is obviously what they've done in the past. Um, but to express the legislative intent that we do want these newer businesses included in any future federal discretionary funding that's allocated to the state. Yes. Okay. Good. Does anybody have any questions for the center? Uh, Just a clerk question. Uh, yeah. Yes. Could, Senator, could you please uh, submit your written testimony if that's possible? Absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Representative Bartlett, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator, for coming um, before our committee. Um, a, a question that I've got is, were the um, limitations to the COVID relief funds set by the state or set by the federal, um, federal guidelines? Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Representative. In our case, the date of May 26, 2019 was not contained in the federal guidelines. It was um, imposed on the businesses by the state. Okay, may I ask another question? Of the course, question please. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to put my insurance hat on because I was um, in insurance for 35 years. And one of the issues um, that businesses have after a loss is being able to establish what their receipts would have been, but for the loss. Um, what kinds of requirements um, would you see that would be reasonable to put on a newly opened business who had not had receipts? Sure, and thank you again for the thoughtful question, Representative. So. I understand that this poses some challenge um, and I appreciate your insurance hat analyzing it. Um, however, I do, you know, I do think there are ways that we can help these newer businesses um, show or establish, you know, a loss due specifically to the pandemic. For example, banks that provide, you know, construction financing or even the very lenders that lent to these businesses due diligence based on, for example, industry standard receipts or market research or appraisals that help um, those very banks, you know, project what the income streams will be for these businesses and lending them money. Um, and in addition, I do think, you know, there is industry data from around the country that while not, um, while it may not be from that individual business can certainly help us help our businesses, you know, to, to do the diligence we need to do to make sure that um, we can both, you know, exercise due care in allocating these funds to these businesses and yet recognize that simply because they don't have 2019 receipts doesn't mean that they're not a new business that adds to our community and doesn't need our support. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for the Senator? Uh, see none, okay, Senator Bradley, because I know that's who Jeb is. <laughs> this is Jeb Bush, maybe. <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Hunt and members of the committee. Uh, good to see all of you folks. Um, I just want to second the remarks of my colleague, represent, uh, Senator Perkins Quoke. I think she did an excellent job outlining the testimony that uh, the Senate Commerce Committee heard from a number of small businesses, some of whom I believe are on your um, public hearing this morning. I think one of the things that was very compelling is um, when somebody had purchased a business that was an existing business, they were deemed to be a new business and they did not have access um, to either Main Street um, funds. And so it just seems to make sense uh, to all of us in the Senate that um, the same kind of criteria apply to these new businesses um, that um, are for businesses that have been in existence a little longer, um, especially businesses that are brand new or um, recently purchased. Obviously, there's going to be a significant amount of money, federal money coming to New Hampshire 
Um, I think it's very pr premature to say what that money is going to be used for, but should there be something similar to uh, the Main Street Relief Fund or a second version of it, I, I think we would hope that these businesses that were not able to participate would be able, and that's what this bill does. So um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to support Senate Bill 107. Okay, any other questions from the committee members? Thank uh, you. So, yeah, when we're all set, thank you, Jim. Uh, okay, so now Mr. Clark, you're, now, now we can hear from you. All right, here, let me. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I'm Doug Clark. I have a couple of uh, restaurants in downtown Durham. Um, we, uh, we applied for the first round of the Main Street Relief and uh, we're told that we should have known better than to open businesses uh, in 2020. Uh, but uh, they, we kind of the, our story kind of fell on deaf ears, which is that uh, new businesses take years to plan. And in our case, we formed our LLC in 2018. We hired our general manager in 2019 and started our payroll. Uh, we acquired our property in March of 2019. We completed our plans and got all our approvals to the town in spring of 2019 began construction of a restaurant in June of 2019, hired a chef in August of 2019, and then we prepared all our menus and recipes in that fall. We completed construction in March just to find out that our equipment, our fabricator for our kitchen equipment was Rhode Island, and in March, Rhode Island shut everything down, so we weren't able to get our equipment delivered until the end of May, uh, and that's all COVID-related, so we weren't able to open until June of 2020. Um, and so uh, with that, and obviously that, that was a time when we had uh, the six foot rule. I mean, the whole uh, capacity restrictions were a bit of a problem for us because even though they say you can do 50%, if you follow the six foot rule, in most cases, it's really only about 30 or 35% of capacity. Um, for us, we we're, uh, we we're happy to have a big sidewalk. So we were able to put uh, 11 outdoor tables in and, uh, and, and just to the point of, can you show an effect on your business? As most of you probably know, summer is usually the slowest time in Durham. Um, and uh, we were doing about $100,000 a month when we had our 11 outdoor tables. Uh, when it started to cool down and the students came back in our town, the residents are scared to death of the students and they kind of slowed down uh, in their willingness to kind of come downtown and eat. Uh, so we saw our revenues go from 100,000 all three months of the summer. And the students came back in September, it went down to 80. In October, it went down to 60. And from November to February, it was down to 50. So in the middle of the winter, without the outdoor tables, our business was half of what it was in the summer. And the summer are traditionally the three slowest months of the year in Durham, New Hampshire. Um, so, and then just the other point is independently owned businesses, to me, uh, need more help than old businesses. We have, you know, we're sitting here with dreamers. This is my retirement plan. We put all of our life savings into this. And then we got hit by COVID. Uh, we don't have years of, uh, of profits in our history where we could have built up any kind of a foundation or a base. You know, we're really struggling kind of day to day. Um, and even more to the point, new businesses are needed because they're more relevant than old businesses uh, and better positioned to meet the current needs of the community. In our case, Durham, Durham's downtown had migrated from being in the 60s, it was primarily a, a, a resident oriented business with 90% of our business catered to the residents. We had family restaurants all over the place. Over the course of time, it reversed and now about 90% of the business catered to the students. It's a ro rotating door. And so the residents to me are the most underserved demographic in the state of New Hampshire, the residents and the adults of Durham. And, and people don't seem to understand there are always more adults in Durham than students any given day of the year. And obviously they have far more disposable income. The average student comes to town with about $1,600 in their pocket which is why we have this crazy revolving door of student-oriented businesses in downtown Durham. Um, and so in closing, I just wanna emphasize the importance of investing in Main Street, uh, local investment into local businesses, keep money locally, instead of the big chains and big, you know, the, the big chain restaurants. To me, I'm sure that more, most of that money goes out of the state when it's all said and done. And uh, to us, we're the, the future of, um, of having economic sustainability um, is to make sure we have a Main Street downtown in every town. And thanks for listening. You're on mute, Mr. Chair. 
Sorry, I keep forgetting I turned it on. So Representative Herbert, do you have a question? Yes, I do, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Um, there's a whole new, uh, uh, there's a $1.9 trillion uh, bill, I think that has been passed. And so uh, is it your uh, anticipation that you will be able to uh, access uh, some of the state's money, I mean, some of the federal money that's coming in through Congress into Concord uh, that would be aimed at uh, businesses? I mean, even though the governor didn't allow you to uh, enjoy any uh, financial aid with the last uh, amount of money. What is your uh, what is your opinion as to your future with uh, that 1.9 trillion, uh, of which I think 400 million dollars of it is expected to land uh, uh, on the governor's uh, pockets or desk rather. I'm sorry, and. Uh, I uh, just would like your opinion as to whether or not uh, you think you may be able to access some financial support uh, going forward. That's uh, well, so for us, the um, it's all about this bill. I mean, if the criteria doesn't change, then we again won't qualify. Um, and so for the state money, uh, the Federal Restaurant Recovery Act is another program and but basically handcuffed with some of the same restraints. I do hear there's some provision for small business, with, uh, but I haven't seen what the details of that formula are yet. Uh, but, but for the most part, all of these programs tend to disqualify new businesses because you don't have 2019 revenue to compare to 2020. Further question? Further question. Chairman? So is that no? <laughs> well, I'm you, hoping, you're... well, obviously we're sitting here help we're we're hoping and testifying to get uh, the state to say that um, new businesses would qualify for the next round of Main Street relief. We think that's critical uh, rather than, you know, for me, I, um, I ran the innovation department at Timberland. We, uh, I was a new business incubator. We kept building all these new brands, buying companies. And uh, in the end, when the, um, the chairman decided to sell the company, he said, let's uh, get rid of our distractions. And I'm, uh, my attitude was, you can't throw the babies out with the bathwater. The babies are the future. You know, the new businesses are the ones that are going to pave the way that are the most relevant. And so for the new business to be disqualified from federal aid with the old businesses, and, and in my frustration, a lot of the old businesses got their Main Street relief and they basically went into hibernation. And so they didn't, they didn't even maintain a payroll during that period of time. Whereas we've hired 45 people and we've kept them on the payroll ever since we opened. And that's our intent is to um, keep people employed and keep the economy going as best we can. One final question, uh, Chairman Hunt. Sure. Uh, if this law, if this uh, particular piece of legislation passes, uh, would that change the uh, calculus for you? I believe so. How much so. money he's going to get? Yeah, it depends on well, what we get, but I think anything helps at this point. I mean, we're clinging on, um, but uh, we're we're losing money. Uh, we're uh, We've had to make major adjustments with our takeout business instead of our, our uh, dine-in business. Um, we've had to invest a lot of money in setting up uh, HEPA filters and cleaning systems uh, in, our, in our air conditioning systems, uh, sanitizers, masks, um, outdoor tables, outdoor chairs. We actually literally rebuilt the sidewalks in front of our restaurant, which cost $20,000, $30,000. Um, but that was how that was the only way we were able to kind of get through last summer and then navigate as best we could through the winter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, now, uh, Patrick Kennedy, Kelly, excuse me. Okay, Patrick, all you have to do is unmute yourself. Ah, uh, my apologies. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for uh, all the representatives here. I'm, I just wanted to add my support for SB 107, give you a little bit of background. My name is Patrick Kelly. I'm representing Strike Nine Brewing, and um, just a little bit of our background. We uh, also purchased a 5,000 square foot 
um, used to be a pharmacy in a revitalization zone of Summersworth, New Hampshire in 20, 2018. Uh, we spent about a year converting the existing building into a brewery and brew pub. So uh, just like the previous speaker, um, we went through licensing, um, permitting, um, approvals, change of use, et cetera, uh, to open Strike 9 in September of 2019. Uh, at the time, we employed 20 employees. Uh, we were closed uh, per governor order on March 16th, 2020. Um, one of the challenges that we had is we did not develop our business model for a takeout model. Um, this is a brew pub for those of you who have been to a brew pub. Uh, most people like to go in and enjoy the entertainment. Um, we were closed, so uh, we temporarily closed and then reopened in April, uh, end of April 2020, uh, attempting to try the takeout model. Um, the end result, just from a, in, in terms of revenue, is our revenue fell, even with a takeout model, um, more than 50% quarter over quarter. Um, so to answer uh, one of the questions that came up from Representative Bartlett, uh, one of the things that I would advocate for this bill is for businesses that were open, but not for a full year, um, you could use a proxy in previous quarters to get a sense for what the receipts were and how much of a uh, loss there was uh, to businesses that were open less than a year. Um, one of the things I would say is, you know, for any of the people speaking today, small business owners, nobody could really foresee the pandemic in the risk assessment of opening a business and its, you know, overall impact. Um, so, uh, you know, my view is that for businesses open less than a year, they're probably uh, equally harmed, probably even in some cases more financially impacted because working capital reserves are stressed in the first year of startup. So if you look at the first year of startup, there's a lot of hiring, training, um, essentially paying for permitting and license fees um, and really trying to get the business open um, you know, the Main Street Fund would have helped um, sort of get through some of the financial challenges uh, that were had. And I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the positive things about this bill is uh, if it's passed, um, it sort of brings uh, some sort of parity back uh, to those businesses that were, in my opinion, more severely impacted um, as a result of the pandemic and, and being open less than a year. Um, one other uh, thing that I'll just note is um, this came up in the Senate hearing. There was a question about, you know, funding of any businesses that may not survive. And I think that's a legitimate question uh, for taxpayers and representatives um, is, you know, why fund a business that may fail? Um, I think, you know, uh, you know, businesses that are looking for any funds should be able to provide a profit and loss and a balance sheet that does that does indicate that uh, they will survive uh, this pandemic uh, because it's you know it's taxpayer money that's being issued um, again I think small businesses uh, have been hurt um, more so than larger businesses uh, but they do have to prove that they can survive uh, it, you know, on a long-term basis. Um, thank you for your time and, um, I'll take any questions. Okay. Uh, any questions from the committee? Seeing none, we're all, thank you. Uh, we're all set. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, last but not least is, uh, Elizabeth. Pumpkins. Good, good morning. Let me fix my computer. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, allow me to introduce myself. I am Elizabeth Tompkins, and of September 2019, I became the owner of Putting on the Glitz, 40 Market Street, downtown Portsmouth. Um, this is my fifth year here. I was employed. I had two jobs to get here, and I'm here to testify on behalf of SB 107 in favor of it because um, with the new businesses, you know, I think I'm going to be 
riding on the backs of what has already been said but we don't wake up one morning and say, tomorrow I'm gonna to open. It takes two to three years to get there. Um, I worked here, I was a dental hygienist, health reasons, had to retire, um, landed here with the previous owner and about six months in um, the conversation, she approached me to purchase the business. I set right out to score and took my courses, um, how to own a business first, you know, how to get your first commercial business loan. Um, I then went to Small Business Development Association. I'm still a client there, and they have guided me through all of this. Um, when the first Main Street grant came up last spring, I was like, okay, I don't qualify, I'm, I'm kind of new. Gap, we also didn't um, qualify. By November of 2020, I knew we weren't out of this pandemic. And heading into another winter, um, you know, where we do, slow down. We need July, August, September, October through December to build up for those quiet months. Um, I do have record um, of my first quarter, which was the last quarter of 2019. Um, I matched what the previous owner did and a little bit above. So the formula worked. And what is that formula? I was questioned that and with the Senate. Um, what that is, is your business model. And it takes two years to build that, get your own ducks in a row and then negotiate, get a business valuation. And now those procedures to get a loan are based on the previous owner's numbers. So we have those numbers. Um, this time there was an appeal process, but I got nowhere. And I reached out to the governor and the senators and it was Senator Rebecca Koka that answered my call literally. Um, so here we are now. Yes, it would have helped these last three months um, you know, I've reduced orders. There was no computerized inventory. So what did I do during the shutdown, the mandated shutdown last spring? I came in every day. And if you can kind of see my lovely little shop in here, there's a lot of inventory. I purchased existing inventory. I manually put that into the computer. I was hoping to get to a shoppable website, thinking some funding would come in, but it's just not in the budget. I cut marketing. Um, I use my PPP to keep four women employed. We cut hours in January and February is to not bleed the payroll till the next PPP comes in. Um, as small business owners we already know, we work seven days a week and I, I can do six days a week here, but not seven. We used to have four women seven days a week or four people. Um, so my first question, you know, not, not to be asking rhetorically, but to keep moving is, you know, why May 2019, even in November of 2020? Um, I had financials to go back to. And second, there was no ro robust appeal process. There, I made two typographical errors and there it took four weeks to correct that. And I was able to correct them, but again, it came down to the date. And I just feel like some of us, the new businesses are falling through the cracks. And to go back to, it was also said, purse strings versus heartstrings. I'm a taxpayer in this state. Um, and the country, and I would not begrudge anyone receiving any monies um, because I'm one of those taxpayers. And new businesses are so crucial. You know, I'm. people were excited to see me take over and add in the inventory that I did. Um, there's room for growth still. If I don't make it, you will have a corporate hat shop and jewelry store in town, I guarantee you, because they now know there's room for it, because I found my niche. I grew up from the previous owner. The previous owner was here 15 years. Um, she, th That person put this business in Yankee Magazine, Polo Magazine. We're big for Derby. We're big for Easter. We're big for bridal. So I was affected similar to, you know, event people because people weren't going out. Um, and it just would have been nice. I'm not, I don't want help. I don't like asking for help. But this is my sole source of income. I put like, like um, Mr. Clark said, it's, it's sort of my end of life. This is what I'm going to do. And I work hard physically and passionately. I'd much rather work with customers than be here because this is public speaking. Is not my favorite thing? Um, but I just feel that, you know, the, young, the, if I have projections for my business that a loan officer and a business valuation could agree to, I can also provide that for any financial information and gladly to do so to receive even just a little cushion that sits there just in case. 
a year-long pandemic has exhausted anybody's resiliency plan. You think three, six months, okay, I, I did that. I didn't pay myself last winter. I haven't paid myself this winter. I'm keeping one person employed. I'm ready to bring back more. Um, we went curbside. I do Zooms for people. I do private appointments. Anything I could do to, to keep the cash flow going. But my December and November were down fifteen thousand dollars i mean i don't I, I think a lot of people don't realize what the shop was doing and because this is a public hearing i'm not i'm not going to discuss that i'm happy to provide that to the state um so my third i have two more quick questions um when they're talking about what funding's coming there's also what could be done with plans for funds to redistribute money that might be paid back. There are some businesses I'm hearing that have to pay it back because they received grants from multiple sources. I did not. Um, they might have made more money because their industry was more needed during the pandemic. Um, so there's maybe a way to funnel the money to us sooner. I don't know. Um, and I guess what I woke up in the middle of the night and one of many sleepless nights in this past year when I started writing to my governors and my senator, my governor and my senators, was if I'm not, if the people testifying here are not Main Street as you label this grant money, then who is? And I think some people have answered to that. And I don't begrudge the companies who've worked hard, but without a year of revenue under my belt, I think I've done really well to make my economic injury loan last. That's supposed to cover the three months of closure. I've managed to make that last. So. Um, there are people this past weekend, people are excited that I'm still here. Um, they're excited to get out as, you know, stimulus and vaccinations, but without the foot traffic and without the tourism, anybody in town, small brick and mortar, which is the heart of Portsmouth, needs some assistance. And I implore you to vote on some sort of form of SB 107. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your time and attention. Great. Thank you so much for coming in. Anybody else uh, have a question for her? Uh, I don't see any. Thank you very much. And uh, Representative Perez, I'm, I apologize. I don't know how long you were there, but I did not see you. And But now I know you're there, so you're uh, certainly invited to testify. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, good, good morning, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Maria Perez. I represent District 23 in Milford. Uh, today I'm testifying in support of this bill. Now more than ever, I see our, our small businesses in Milford and uh, the towns around Milford suffering. Uh, we see a lot of business going out of business. And to be honest, I see that uh, the potential in the small business in my community. Um, I see that uh, people supporting the small businesses um, I've been uh, going around and visiting some of the small businesses in my town um, just to show the support. Um, since last year, at the beginning of last year when the pandemic started, um, I went around and visited the businesses, uh, try to like bring the awareness that um, when we supported small businesses is like helping our communities to grow, um, not just the business itself, but we depending in the income coming in and we depending of, of the jobs uh, getting created by these small businesses. So I, I will ask you, every one of you to support this bill because I, I know that the small businesses, they going through a tough times, but I know with the support of the people in the community and the support us from us is that state representatives in supporting this bill, uh, we, we're gonna go through this. We, I believe in our communities working together and working together as a one team, not Democrats and Republicans. We have to think about this bill. It's like we supporting everyone, everyone who uh, uh, believe in us, believe that uh, we here for a reason, we here to do a job, we here to show that we can work together to bring uh, better better opportunities and better future for our communities. Thank you so much for your time. That's very nicely said. Any questions from the committee members? Uh, I don't see anything. So thank you very much for 
coming in. Thank you so much. And, uh, last I have is uh, Ms. Vashon, Vashon, Valerie Vashon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Valerie Roshan, the president of the uh, Chamber Collaborative of Greater Portsmouth, the Chamber of Commerce for Portsmouth. And uh, good morning to you, Chairman Hunt and uh, members of the committee. And thank you for allowing me to speak on this SB 107. Uh, we represent close to 800 businesses in the Greater Portsmouth area. Small businesses of less than 10 employees comprise 80% of our membership. I'm here to testify in support of SB 107 relative to financial assistance for businesses affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The intentions of the Main Street Relief Fund allocated from the CARES Act funds were good in that the need for financial support necessary to shore up our businesses was recognized and action taken. However, some of our small businesses, some of them you've heard of from, from today, who desperately needed and still need the financial support provided to others have been left to fend for themselves. SB 107 proposes that entrepreneurs who started businesses shortly before and during the pandemic, and those who purchased pre-existing businesses during the same period will be eligible for federal relief funds. There's nothing more Main Street as you've heard already this morning than our locally owned small entrepreneurial businesses who employ our local residents those who started businesses during this time agonized over business plans and financial projections, which were sufficient in most cases to bring to the banks to get the funds for their startups. Why then would they not also be accommodated in the Main Street Fund program? What of new owners who purchased existing businesses with years of financial data? You just heard from Elizabeth. They have, they have proven track records of successful re revenue generation and net profits, yet they were also denied access to these critical funds. And yes, there was an appeals process, which was difficult, if not impossible, to navigate with business owners frustrated in their attempt to speak with a real human being. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I urge you to not, not let these small businesses who are the backbone of our community and our economy fall by the wayside yet again when the new relief package is funded by, to the state. So I urge you please to vote to pass SB 107, which allows new businesses and new business owners to be eligible for federal relief funds. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. And I see uh, my clerk put up his hand. So I'm sure he's going to ask you that if you mind just loading that up um, in our web page so that we could have your testimony. I can do that. Thank you. Uh, is there any other questions from the committee members? Seeing none, we thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, oh, there's another hand just went up. <laughs> it's amazing how that works. Okay. Kevin Dwyer. Are you on my list, Kevin? I don't, I don't, I don't. Oh, yeah, you are on my list. There you are. Okay. Go ahead. We can see you. <laughs> and are you you're not muted, right? Oh, you're muted. You got to unmute yourself. Nope. No, he's not there anymore. Can you hear me, Kevin? You just have to unmute yourself or maybe you have to re. He's there and I'm asking him to unmute, but. Um... Right. Well, you could see his picture and then he went out. So you wonder whether we right. have a glitchy, glitchy, glitchy there. Let's look. Um, Okay, now see, I see him back over. He so we dialed in again. So let me promote him back up again. Okay, try again. All right. Hello. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, I won't take up too much time. I appreciate you guys um, listening to us all and uh, taking the time today. Uh, I pretty much could echo everything that Doug Clark said. I uh, purchased a, uh, a local Thai restaurant in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, in uh, June of 2019, was opened by December of 2019. And then, so I had three months of sales before uh, the COVID shutdown on March 16th, of 2020. 
Um, I guess the only additional point I'd like to make is uh, in, I'm kind of in a unique situation in Portsmouth, which is a large, um, you know, tourism accounts for a lot of our, uh, the local restaurant industry. Um, if you pay attention to the business that businesses that have come and gone since COVID uh, hit a year ago, uh, a lot of them are the larger chains that, um, you know, did employ locally, but uh, that, I mean, like if, if they're a larger chain that has locations from here to Atlanta, you know, they pretty much just look at a balance sheet and then uh, trim the fat for whichever store. So, you know, wasn't the producer for them. So I don't think the, the larger restaurant groups uh, have as much of a concern for the local economy as uh, a local young business owner like myself. Uh, I employ everybody lives in the greater Portsmouth area that I employ. And, uh, and I, I don't have like a, an allegiance, I guess, to um, anywhere foreign. It's just, um, it's, I'm from Portsmouth and I want to stay in Portsmouth and my business is in Portsmouth. Uh, so I guess if you pay attention to who's coming in to the town uh, since all of this, it's a lot of larger restaurant groups that, uh, you know, could foreseeably do the same thing they're not from here and if, uh, if it didn't work out they're they're not as invested in the community uh, and then you know they, they looked at my spot before I opened and uh, I know that they've looked at my spot as COVID's hit uh, so um, it's you know this bill would help protect uh, local I mean it is called Main Street uh, Main Street business that and I'm, I'm 29 years old and I would like to keep grow this business uh, for the next several decades and continue to um, be a integral part of my community's economy. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't see any questions. Any more people who want to speak? Uh, I guess we're all set. So we had 68 people in support, no opposition, nobody neutral. <laughs> and with that, I will close the public hearing on Senate Bill 107. And I think that's it for the day. So we will pick this up again tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. See you all and all have a wonderful afternoon. We've got this done right at noon. Boy, what a, there's a lot of marvel <laughs> right at noon. Timing and, is everything. And uh, very, very briefly, Mr. Chairman, we yes. there will be a commerce room set up in the LOB tomorrow in 201, 203, just um, for those who want to attend in person. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Yeah, right. For those who, who are there, sort of, right. you're there in the room. Okay. Thank you all. And